Good morning, everybody. We'd like to call back to order the Board of Supervisors budget hearings. Uh, if we could actually begin with a roll call, please. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Kunitri? Here. Caffet? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Friend? I am here. We are going to begin with uh, land use and community services today. We have a presentation on the land use and community services budget categories provided uh, under the proposed budget pages 175 to 177. Ms. Rowery, I understand you are going to give the overview. Yes, I am. Good morning, Chair Good Friend, morning. members of the board. Christina Mallory, the county budget manager. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the land use and community services budget category uh, before you consider the budgets today. Um, get started here. So the departments, you'll see a listing of them there, range from between the Agricultural Commissioner all the way to the Redevelopment Successor Agency, um, Parks, Planning, Public Works, uh, Library Fund, Monterey Bay Air Resources District, and uh, the um, land use and community services category expenditures are approximately $205 million for the upcoming fiscal year. This represents 26% of all county budget expenditures for fiscal year 18-19. This is a 3.2% decrease over the previous fiscal year. This is primarily from the completion of several housing grants. Uh, this chart shows a share of expenditures by department and agency. And you can see here that Public Works uh, represents about 67% of the total. The largest expenditure is services and supplies, which comprises about $103 million. Salaries and benefits of uh, about 56 million support 413 positions, an increase of nine positions from the previous fiscal year. Additional expenditures include about 40 million in other charges, 6 million in fixed assets, and 5.2 million in other financing and contingencies. The land use and community services uh, category revenues are approximately 172 million this year or 84% of total financing, with the general fund and other funds making up the difference, or 16%, uh, to meet the expenditure needs. Land use and community services financing represents 30% of the total budgeted revenues and is comprised of 70, almost 80 million in charges for services, uh, 47 million in intergovernmental funds, uh, 32 million in taxes, about uh, almost 10 million in licenses and permits, Four million in miscellaneous and use of money um, for a total of 172 million. Uh, there's about an eight million uh, general fund contribution, and 24 and a half million in other funds, which make up the remainder of the financing. This ch chart shows the share of financing by department and agency, and note that the agricultural extension, LAFCO, and the Monterey Bay Air Resources District are not represented as they are totally supported by the general fund which is shown on the next slide. Um, public Works, we've already discussed, is the largest share of the land use and community services, which is at 73%. And here you'll see the general fund contribution by department. It's approximately $8 million, um, which represents about 6% of the total general fund net cost. And further details are provided in each of the department budget proposals. Um, here you can see planning um, makes up about 28% uh, of that and parks over 50% of that total. And then while there are critical unmet needs such as the completion of Chanticleer and the farm parks and deferred maintenance on much of our infrastructure and facilities, we want to acknowledge just a few of the accomplishments of the land use and community services area this year. From the beginning of the storm damage repairs to the housing unit creation, from completing deferred maintenance on some of our older park facilities to securing nearly two and a half million for homelessness programs. From employing new technologies for more efficient work when employees are in the field to being at the forefront of developing usable alternatives to ban pesticides. Our land use departments continue to work protecting the health, safety, and welfare of Santa Cruz County citizens. The largest of the land use and community service departments will provide presentations on the regular agenda. The status quo budget proposals are included on the consent agenda for the Agricultural Commissioner, the Agricultural Cooperative Extension, LAFCO, Library Fund, Monterey Bay Air Resources District, and the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Department heads are available today to answer any of your questions. 
Thank you for the brief introduction on land use and community services. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Mowry, thank you for the presentation. Just had a quick question. In the sure. chart that you showed, mm -hmm. it showed 10% of the revenues were from redevelopment and 8% of, of the expenditures were for redevelopment. Mm -hmm. Is that for the remaining project that we have uh, over on uh, uh, by the harbor? Yeah, so that's just the, yes, okay. yes. That's just a small share of redevelopment revenue that's remaining, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions on the presentation? Uh, sure. Supervisor Caput. So this is covering the whole consent part of the agenda. Yeah, we can yeah. go through, uh, we can uh, look at the consent agenda now, which includes Agricultural, Commissioner Agricultural and Extension, LAFCO Library Fund, the Air Board, and the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I want to thank you also. And uh, uh, what I've always been interested in, in uh, especially South County, is the Agricultural uh, uh, Commission, because we have so much agriculture. But it's also a fascinating uh, office, because you also have weights and measures, and they have mos uh, mosquito uh, control. Uh, and I've been bringing up every year on the con uh, weights and measures. Uh, they're the ones like Consumer Affairs, uh, they go out there and they make sure people get what they're paying for, right? So anyway, my ongoing uh, uh, battle with the big corporations is uh, Skippy Peanut Butter and Jif Peanut Butter. They, uh, Skippy Peanut Butter a couple of years ago took out about an ounce and a half out of what they're selling you and the, uh, it looks the same on the shelf. So after I said that they were cheating people on that, uh, Jif was the one I was recommending. Well, that was like the uh, kiss of death because then the following year, just last year, Jif now is taking out two and a half ounces uh, out of their peanut butter and uh, they're smaller than the uh, jar that's on the shelf for Skippy peanut butter. So anyway, my battle will continue with the big corporations and uh, maybe, uh, am, am I correct on this? Uh, and uh, I'm sure you're on top of it. Uh, maybe I'll ask the uh, Agriculture uh, Commissioner. I, I just have to say that the board actually every year only looks forward to budget hearings for this one reason. I mean, this is so, every year we get this and it's amazing to hear about it. It's a quest. We, we a learn quest. about peanut butter and his preference of creamy over crunchy and the amount of ounces and, and, and uh, and Juan, I know that this is why you sought this position. The, and so we appreciate uh, you coming forward to speak about the uh, number of ounces in peanut you. butter right now. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Board. Juan Hidalgo, Agricultural Commissioner, and also sealer of Weights and Measures. Uh, it is true. Uh, unfortunately, packaging is shrinking in the marketplace, um, and we do keep an eye out for that. Uh, one of the things that we look for is for slack field, where you have companies that keep the same size packaging but give you less. So it looks like you're still getting the same amount, but when you open the package, you realize that it's, it's a lot less. So one of the things that we look for is to make sure that if you're gonna give customers less product, that you also make the packaging to fit that product so that people can see that uh, you're getting uh, a little bit less. Uh, the other thing that uh, companies are doing nowadays is that they keep the price the same, but of course they give you less. And so that's one of the strategies that uh, uh, industry have been using in the last few years. And we do get complaints like this every once in a while. And so we also work with the RDA's office uh, whenever there is a complaint or there might be an issue with misleading packaging out there in the marketplace, so we work with uh, the DA's office to kind of follow up on those issues. Uh, what, what I was uh, interested in was uh, when I went down to your office uh, in uh, Live Oak area, uh, they were actually measuring, uh, uh, when I was there, <coughs> juice. Uh, 64 ounces, a half a gallon used to be normal. Now when you buy Dole's uh, juice, instead of 64 ounces, it's 59, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And actually that was a case that uh, we followed up and we worked on, like, on our DA, with our DA's on and uh, they ended up, ended up filing a lawsuit against them and the co company paid because that was a slack fill issue where they actually kept the container size the same, they didn't adjust it for the, you know, you were getting five ounces less. Um, and so hopefully that has been sold by now and these companies are yeah. shrinking the size of the package so that 
uh, consumers can know that they're getting a little bit less now. Okay, so now I'm taking on another big corporation like uh, the Juice, uh, Dole's Juice uh, Corporation now. Uh, so anyway, your staff is only about two on weights and measures. You go around to different stores and check stuff out, right? We do, so I have two staffs that that's all they do is weights and measures work and uh, they check all the scales in the county, any measuring device, all the gas stations, um, any measuring and weighing device that may be used for commercial purposes, uh, my staff is gonna be inspecting and soon that's gonna include cannabis scales at cultivation sites and uh, distribution sites. You bet, thanks a lot. And next year we'll have an update on all this uh, when we have budget hearings. I'll bring jelly. <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, moving r right along beyond peanut butter. Um, I'd like to comment on two of the six items that are on the consent agenda, and one is the library fund to, again, thank the voters of Santa Cruz County for approving Measure S, which is a quarter cent sales tax, and uh, then the cooperative effort, the maintenance of effort with the four cities and the county for its operation. We are seeing, beginning to see the fruition of that measure that was passed uh, in 2014, and I can't tell you how excited uh, in my district the people are. Uh, there's improvements to Boulder Creek, but and Scotts Valley as well, but uh, especially in Felton, where we have a, a real special uh, project going on with the library itself, and now an adjacent park that's going to be with an interpretive center. It's um, it's a, just a terrific uh, addition to the Santa Rosa Valley, and I know that you would say the same, each of you, in your districts uh, for the improvements that are going on the library. We're gonna have a 9,000 foot library compared to today's 1,500 square foot. Uh, the Lardy Memorial Building, which will become a historical museum, as a matter of fact. So that's it's a twofer, but uh, I just wanted to say uh, th thank you to the voters of Santa Cruz County uh, what you did and what you supported were, were carrying through and some really great improvements are, are going to occur. So uh, I think uh, each of us could say that about the library, maybe San Diego Santa Cruz right now, it's a little dicey uh, with what they're gonna do, but, uh, uh, and then also on Monterey Bay Air Resources District, I know that some of our board members, including the chair is on that. Uh, I wanna thank uh, that, that board and Richard Stedman, the CEO, to, uh, for his efforts to, get a grant to for uh, upgrading wood burning stoves. It's a huge issue in San Lorenzo Valley. The district consistently for the last several years has put in $75,000 that it really didn't have extra to spend to have people trade out, change out those stoves. I think this, this uh, uh, grant is for three or 400,000 at least and it's going to be much more. I just encourage the people of San Lorenzo Valley to participate in this and uh, you'll get some uh, credits for it, you'll get some uh, revenue for it if you wanna change out your wood stove, which is a serious problem in San Lorenzo Valley. So uh, I wanna tip my hat to the Monterey Bay Air Resources District and uh, thank you very much for that effort. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, just uh, briefly on the Monterey Bay Air Resources Board, one of the really uh, cool programs, which is we're one of the few districts in the country to do this, is we're giving out uh, vouchers for used electric vehicles. So it not only reduces our carbon footprint, uh, but also helps with equity issues uh, in our community of giving people uh, lower cost access to, to alternative co fuel cars and, um, and saving them money on gasoline and other costs. And so um, I'm really proud of that effort. We authorized it and uh, we're working with the dealers to bring, uh, to, br to get that information out to people. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanna just comment on a couple items on the consent agenda. I wanna thank our, our partners uh, who work in agriculture. Uh, we just heard from the Agricult Agricultural Commissioner and uh, in addition to his peanut butter work, he does all this work uh, uh, supporting our, our agricultural community and uh, has done a great job in keeping us informed and the public informed about invasive pests that have come into our community and the good work that the office does um, to help prevent the spread of these pests. I really appreciate that and the work of the staff. Um, uh, agricultural extension, the support that you offer to our farmers is also uh, critically important. The last thing that I'll just say is uh, the local uh, agency formation commission budget, which is here, it's fairly modest, but it's doing uh, important work. Uh, um, in August, 
uh, we'll be doing a joint meeting with the Central Fire District and the Athos La Selva Fire District to talk about whether there is efficiencies that can be gained in services um, if through consolidation of services or possible merger. Um, and that's incredibly important work for our community. It's incredibly important for the taxpayers and, uh, and important for public safety. I look forward to that conversation. Good I appreciate question. their work. Mr. Caput. Yeah, one more thing actually on a more serious note. Uh, we do have uh, Mark Bolda with us from uh, Ag Extension. And uh, maybe if I could ask a quick question on, uh, we had the uh, methyl bromide before and the methyl iodide and uh, finally that, that cleared up. And uh, now what are they doing uh, that's more natural and less uh, uh, dangerous, I guess, to uh, uh, people working in the fields? Okay. Um, it, it's actually a longer topic. I know both uh, you and, and Carlos attended our extension meeting this last February. It's a bit of a heavy lift. You know, methyl bromide had been used since 1960, and now we're looking for alternatives currently. Uh, Chlorpicrin's being used. Uh, you, you know, again, it's a, it's a gas, lacrimogenic, so we're kind of looking. On the other side, you have options such as mustard seed oil. Um, you have some, some fumigants of less, lesser uh, toxicity to the environment. Uh, actually, Juan has been working closely with us to make sure that the regulations are being met on that. So, big topic, moving forward on it. There's support you know, from USDA. I've got a grant from the CD, uh, CDPR, and so if you want any details, let me know. Yeah, uh, what, uh, there was something, uh, it looked promising that rice, a certain type of rice, if you mixed it in with the soil. Ooh, rice bran, yeah. Uh, so, okay, yeah, rice bran is, is, so it's being used as an amendment to the soil. It does change the ecology of the soil. You have different organisms now growing in the soil. I mean, think if you change a grassland to kind of a redwood forest, the ecological shift that happens there, you're essentially doing the same thing in the soil. Uh, when you do that, however, uh, there's some issues with one of the pathogens that we have in strawberries that we're actually accelerating the growth of that pathogen with something like rice bran. So we need to know, it's more of an integrated approach now that we're taking to these soils than we have before. We need to know what the pathogen is. We need to kind of look at the ecology of the soil. I, I don't want to lose the board here on these sorts sure. of things, but we're really, you know, looking, people need to really know what they're dealing with. Methyl bromide was just one shot, does it all. That's not the case anymore. A lot yeah. more details. And, and why this is so important, uh, now we're looking at more natural, more um, uh, less um, danger to uh, the farm workers that are actually working out there in, in the fields. That's, that's true, and that, that's why we're looking at these materials. I will tell you, you, you referred to corporations before, some of the larger corporations, they see the writing on the wall too. They're looking at more biologically oriented approaches to pest management as well. So they're trying to replace, you know, their portfolio of organophosphates and carbamates with things essentially that are natural in origin. So there, there's a big shift, you know, it's just not, you can't just do it one time, you need to test, you need to understand these things, but it's definitely moving in that direction. You bet. I want to thank you for all the work you're doing and if the people out there want to call you, it's, uh, it's fascinating to talk with you because we can go into all kinds of detail uh, about how they're, you know, uh, growing crops and the, there, there is more, it's going towards organic more now than in the past also. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at, again, uh, one of the, Supervisor Coonerty referred to the crop report uh, from 2004 to 2016. There has been, the acreage dedicated to organic agriculture has gone up in Santa Cruz County. So there is that shift, yes. And the last question when I talked to you about the bees, uh, you know, people complain uh, bees are disappearing uh, oh. and they're very important to pollination. But you were saying that it's actually doing a little better now in, Sacram in Santa Cruz County? Yeah, so again, I, I just hesitate to get too into too many details, but yes, the bee colonies have improved, both the domestic and then the wild. For whatever reason, something like 10 years ago, the numbers of bees went down. It could have been a combination of pesticides, could have been a combination of, you know, the forage crops that are around, but the bee situation has improved over these over Okay, these years. and I guess uh, related to that, is there still, um, were the African uh, bee or <coughs> the, the South American bee is coming up uh, and they're more aggressive and are, is that, is that uh, dissipated somewhat? I need to get back to you on that. I do not know the extent of the Africanized bees. I know they are in California. I think they're only in Southern California. I don't think we have them here, but I need to double check right. for you. Okay. Yeah. So. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for your support. You
Thank you. I'll just make a couple of brief comments. Uh, also thank Mr. Hidalgo and the Agricultural Commission and your, your work in general in, in balancing enforcement and education, your partnership with the Farm Bureau, your partnership with the growers. Um, I've been to a number of uh, events where you are present and I think you really do provide a significant voice on behalf of the county to ensure that people have the education. Uh, but when it comes necessary, you, you, you definitely do the enforcement as well. I think you've, you've brought a, a lot to that office, and I appreciate your leadership on that. Mr. Binding, uh, we had a commentary about you when we had the rates uh, a couple, about a month ago, but um, you know, we, don't, we don't get a lot of complaints about issues regarding vector or mosquitoes because of the work that your office does. I, I know you don't charge very much money, you don't have much staff, but you do an outstanding job keeping our community safe from that. It's really a public health issue, and, and people uh, don't always appreciate things that they don't have a problem with, right? Uh, and since you don't create a problem for people, they don't know to thank you, but, but the board does recognize here, your here. work. Um, in regards to the library, Ms. Nemitz, you work late nights and then you come back early mornings, I understand. I appreciate uh, your <laughs> balance uh, with the city and, and everything you're trying to do throughout the county. I recognize, as uh, Supervisor McPherson said, uh, Measure S is a remarkable gift from the community. We also know uh, as costs escalate, um, that you're doing everything you can to make sure that all of the, of the interests are balanced. Mr. Moser, you've, you've been a dedicated servant to the libraries, unpaid for years. <laughs> and not just, not just the fifth district, by the way, you've yep. been a strong voice for all libraries throughout the county, and, and uh, my district appreciates uh, your work as well. Uh, Mr. McCormick, we appreciate you coming in. We had a million questions, but we just made up the answers before you got here. I just wanted you to know that. Um, <laughs> but your budget was cut in half. And on the air, on the air board, uh, a lot was already said by, by my two colleagues on this, but uh, if you're not familiar with what the Air Resources District does, they actually uh, do a significant amount of work, especially in the unincorporated areas and on dealing with burns, preventing pollution, and also ensuring uh, through a number of their innovative granting programs that we have uh, a lot of options throughout uh, a number of public agencies. They funded electric buses, they funded uh, a lot of electric cars within the fleet here in the county, adaptive signal control projects in the city of Santa Cruz, city of Watsonville, and hopefully in the incorporated area that can uh, reduce pollution. So it's a very innovative uh, organization that uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I also serve on. Uh, we'll open it up to the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community specifically to address us on the consent items. If anybody would like to address us on these items, now would be your opportunity. Good morning again, Chair and Board, Juan Hidalgo, Commissioner. I just want to take a minute to thank your board and the CAO's office for all your support of the Agricultural Commissioner's programs. And my staff and I look forward to the opportunity to improve our community services and also to improve our staff development through the county strategic plan. And then lastly, each year has its own unique of challenges, both for our growers and our community. And I just want to thank my staff for the dedication in helping our clients navigate through these channel challenges to make sure that our programs are, are successful. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on the consent agenda? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I will move the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work on that. We'll begin. Uh, actually, we'll take oral communications as an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Would anybody like to address us today on oral communications? All right. Seeing none, we'll begin the regular agenda. The first item on the regular agenda, item seven, is to approve the 2018-19 proposed budget for Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services Department, including any supplemental budget materials as recommended by the CAO. We have the 2017-18 goals and accomplishments, the 18-19 proposed budget, supplemental budget, unified fee schedule, continu continuing agreement list, and the line item detail. Um, Mr. Gaffney, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Chairman, friend, and fellow board members. Uh, first of all, I wanted to suck up to you guys if I can. <clears throat> um, actually, we're uh, passing out a few things. I'm going to yeah. require some uh, work from you on this. Thank You're going to have some volunteer caps in here, so that means you actually have to come out and volunteer for the parks. Uh, Margaret Ingham's card's in there. She's our volunteer coordinator, so feel free to contact her after this meeting so you can get some work done. Um, there's also a beach blanket and uh, some sunglasses in there as well, so you guys can use those after you do the volunteer work for us. <laughs> So thank you again. We'll be presenting the 1819 uh, proposed budget for uh, parks, and uh, we'll just get right to it here. Uh, we're going to be going over the 2017-18 accomplishments in this 
and we're gonna also be doing the 18, uh, the 1819 budget overview, the 1819 goals for the upcoming year, and some unmet needs we have or future challenges. So, we also had the opportunity to finish our strategic plan. We're right in the draft uh, phase right now, we're the draft copy of our strategic plans out there, and uh, I thought I'd throw this word cloud out there. This is something that was uh, assembled as a result of some of the public meetings, community meetings, and as, as is often with the word clouds, the larger words are the ones that came to mind for a lot of people in our community, so these are the things that are some of our first glance guiding principles for our department. I thought it would be important for everybody to keep that in focus, and it's just a nice nice way to look at parks, or it's maybe the way my brain works. I haven't figured that out yet exactly. <coughs> um, so last year, actually, we were able to finally hire um, uh, the volunteer coordinator that you guys authorized for us to have, so thank you for that. I wanted to highlight a few things that happened as a result of that. We were able to almost double the number of regular volunteers. These are the folks that come in um, whether it's weekly or monthly for us, but there are, are, are almost like employees with the department um, and they do a lot of things for us. So we went from 90 to 163. In addition to that, we did eight group uh, service days, volunteer work days, and had well over 300 people come to those work days. So that's in addition to what we just talked about with the, the number of regular volunteers. In our volunteer hours, we almost tripled the number of volunteer hours, which equated to about $200,000 in, in value to the county. Um, that's just incredible because that is more than the cost of the position, and that's just in our first year. So I'm looking forward to that program getting larger and, and embracing our community even more. A couple of program accomplishments. Um, I, I think um, we are all aware that the department had some cuts and we've had a difficult time recreating programs because we want to make sure they're sustainable and that they provide services that um, are, are good value for the dollar. But one of the programs that we really are proud to be a part of is the Pajaro Valley Girls Initiative, the Girls Paving the Way program. This is a program where we're supporting the girls from the ages of basically the sixth grade to the ninth grade in that time frame, we're gonna be with them for three years and we're gonna provide them things like tutorial assistance, college and career exposure, uh, recreational enrichment, uh, mentor mentorship and leadership. So this is the most vulnerable time for people in our community at the most vulnerable place in our community. And so it's really a great program and we're partnering with a number of organizations on it, which is sort of the theme for our department, as you know, is partnerships, because um, that's the only way we as a parks department feel like we can sustain the long-term legacy that we'd like to leave here for our community. <clears throat> I also wanted to talk about some of the grants that we've been applying for in the last couple of years. We've really done a great job. Um, this is a group of people in our department that other duties as assigned happen to be, they put together um, grants. And so this isn't, we don't have a professional grant writer. We have a group of people who meet somewhat regularly and, and keep their eyes open for grants that are out there. And you can see what a difference that makes, uh, just building that collaboration within our department. Uh, last year, we were successful in receiving $877,000 in grants. This fiscal year so far, we've received over 800,000 and we're looking at, we've applied for almost 2 million in grants. Um, I think that's relevant, especially now, given Prop 68 passed, and so there's going to be several hundred million dollars in grants that will be available over the next couple of years that we'll be able to apply for. And the challenge for us is going to be coming up with dollars for that, actual money, Some usually it's a 50% match, so we have to think about that. Um, oftentimes we can use those volunteer hours I mentioned as grant matches, but um, the, that's not always accepted and it's not um, a, a complete alternative. So just something we have to think about as we move forward. Talking about new community events, it's sort of a way to market our program, market the department and work with other agencies. Um, some of the things we've been doing, working with the, the MAW, as, as you're well aware, I'm sure, um, and Supervisor McPherson, I'm sure you're aware of this as well, that um, the Museum of Art and History is a county park. Um, and so we're partnered with them on a, a number of um, activities. Friday night recess, we'll be doing one coming up here in July. Um, and then with the Aquatic Center, we've really expanded our programming and we've marketed in a different way so that first of all, people are getting more um, bang for their buck, literally getting more entries into the facility and also doing things like the throwback swim or the polar plunge and the Mother's Day swim um, and National Learn to Swim Day. Something we'd like to see in the future is maybe 
possibly free swim lessons for kids in the county if we can. So we're looking to how we can finance that or what we can do to uh, bring resources to bear on that one. Um, family movie nights, thank you, uh, Supervisor Leopold, on that one. We're um, moving forward with family movie nights, Hardest Soquel, Thursdays, um, the third Thursday every month until October, through October. Uh, we're also doing one up at Highlands Park this month on Jul in July. Uh, these are ways, of course, to highlight some of the things that we have in our, our community, some of the new parks that we've opened, and also our department engage our community. So how are we doing um, as we really compare ourselves with other park agencies? If I want you to sort of take a look quickly at those first two graphs, the operating expenditures per capita and the general fund contribution, as it stands with our national peers, we're well below, which is a good place to be. In other words, we don't cost as much as a lot of other parks departments, and we run pretty lean and mean. Um, and then the other two graphs, um, we earned generated revenue and the number of parks. So we have a high number of parks, and we also earn a, a significant amount more in revenue than other agencies across the country. So I think we're doing a good, we're doing well, and we keep our eyes on that, make sure that we continue to be above and below the norms where it's appropriate. All right, so getting to our actual budget. First thing I saw on here was like, oh, wow, okay, why are our revenues down? Well, who do we need to talk to? How are we gonna make more money? Um, but what it turns out is actually that ends up being um, from our storm damage repairs and some of the things that we did uh, last fiscal year, we, we showed that as revenue. And so we had several hundred thousand dollars come in in, in, in revenue as a result of that. So that's the change. Um, it's one of those accounting things. Um, so nothing to be too worried about there. And as we look at uh, total financing, total expenditures, our 3% increase really has to do with uh, salary increases for staff and, and utility costs. So we're looking at every opportunity on how we can reduce our, uh, utility costs. And one of those things, of course, is we just got the solar power uh, in at Simpkins, which is actually going to make a significant difference in how much um, it costs us to keep the lights on and the, the motors running for the pumps to the pool and all of that sort of thing. I do want to point out also that um, as a department, we uh, rely heavily on extra help, which is a, a good type of workforce. It engages the youth of our community, gets them involved in, in recreational programs, youth programs, and, and just caring for, teaches them to care for their community. Um, that's primarily where our seasonal help is, and also it's an efficient use of resources because obviously there's a, a significantly lower cost with extra help seasonal employees. Um, and as you look at it, it's 32% of all our staff hours. It's a pretty significant equivalent to about 22 and a half uh, full-time equivalents. So we are doing something in the supplemental. Um, we're actually taking a park supervisor and converting it to a park maintenance worker three and an admin aide. Um, that's gonna have no uh, increase in the net county cost. That will also provide us better services to the field. The admin aide's gonna help support the maintenance staff in the field and the worker three is more of a field level position. And the 1819 goals, um, we actually are opening our 64th park, um, Twin Lakes Beachfront, uh, thanks to Betsy Lindbergh and, and the uh, public work staff and um, everybody's efforts here, we're gonna be opening up Twin Lakes and uh, maintaining it. Uh, so that's a pretty exciting thing. I have some, we have some ideas on activities we can do down there, hopefully bring in a little money through concessions and also just highlight, once again, uh, this is a county park and welcome to it. Um, we're also gonna be looking at reviewing the park dedication and updating, uh, park dedication fees and updating those. We're looking at how we can get more um, social media presence and more active participation in our events. Um, and for those that don't know, beginning construction of Santa Clara Park is actually code for Leo's Haven, the all-inclusive park. So um, Leo's Haven is gonna be right in the middle of Santa Clara Park and that's, we're actually pretty excited that we'll be getting construction on that. We do have a few financing issues to work out, but we're very far along the, the line on that. Um, and when financing issues work out, I mean that we might need a little bit of help. Um, so complete the bike pump track at Pinto Lake. That actually is a cooperative effort between um, Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Friend. Thank you for working together on that. It's just a great addition to the facility. Long time master planning that we've done there to uh, activate more recreation, and this is a great opportunity to do that. Recreation software sounds really exciting, um, but actually this is going to be um, the sort of the spine, the backbone of our department. This is how people can register for classes. This helps run things in an efficient manner, um, gets programming out there. It really is just a great um, program that we're looking forward to changing. It's an antiquated system we've had, and um, I think we'll be able to track numbers better for everybody. 
um, and then uh, actually start an operations plan based on our, our strategic plan. So that's all the goals that we're gonna be pushing for in this coming fiscal year. So some challenges for the future. Here's just a glance at some of the programs. Uh, I'll read them all to you right now. Um, actually, just kidding. Um, they, um, the number of programs that uh, I, I actually didn't, we actually didn't get them all onto the slide, but we have had a significant number of cuts um, to the department. It's my hope and our hope that we can find a way to sustainably uh, regain some of the, the programs on our slate and it, it really does touch the gamut throughout the community of all the different types of programs that have been cut. So I just want everybody to be aware that um, we're gonna make every effort in within our means to get those programs out there and, and add some programs actually, as I said, even free swim lessons for kids in the community would be a big one. So uh, major capital needs, Leo's Haven. Um, we have an incredible group of uh, community members uh, spearheaded of course by uh, Trisha Potts and Mariah Roberts and they've, they've come close to raising $2 million on their own. We as a department outside of the general fund have raised close to $1.5 million with grants and um, dedication fees and other money that we've cobbled together through uh, contributions. Um, but we do need some help. We're gonna need some help to make, get this across the finish line. We'll be able to at least finish phase one. I'd like to see us get through phase two. We, we can um, really have a beautiful park and, and do it in the most efficient and um, it would be cost effective to do it all at once actually if we are able to do that instead of having to add delete things. Um, so whatever money might be available or whatever resources we have that uh, we can think about, I, I'm happy to work with the board. We will continue to work to find those dollars, but we are set for construction to start next April. So uh, looking forward to that. Possibly even uh, October we may uh, be able to do something as far as groundbreaking. Um, Simpkins Swim Center, uh, it is a 20 plus year old facility. There are a lot of things that um, have begun to show the years. It's been well cared for, but um, something we have to think about, it's gonna be a 1.5 to $2 million renovation in the coming years. We have to figure out how we're gonna do that. I plan to work hard to make sure that we have that and that we work with the community to find resources to do that. Hard to Soquel, Linear Parkway, very exciting. Um, of course, safe routes to school for kids. There's a whole number of tie-ins to the community. It really brings Soquel together. It does provide a heart for Soquel. Um, we have a, just a, um, probably have a million dollars that we've put into it almost at this point, and we have a couple hundred thousand dollars to get across the finish line. Um, given the grants that we have um, coming online, I think we have a good shot at that, and we'll work hard towards that. Um, again, as I said, we may need some matching dollars. Farm parks along the same lines, uh, very close to getting that wrapped up. We have the, uh, the pump track that we're looking at there and as well as the pedestrian bridge and Felton Discovery Park, which is just a great collaboration with the community, with the Felton's library friends and as well as the library. We, um, we think that's gonna be a beautiful addition and we were very fortunate to be successful in a $395,000 grant, which gets us very close to the finish line on that one. So staffing needs, um, I just wanted to highlight, as you've seen in the past, we are still short on the staffing. This was of course the trend in most departments and for us we were keeping in line the number of staff with the number of parks we had out there and the services we provided um, and then the Great Recession hit and you can see the dip that hit us at that point. We're still coming back from that. Um, so as we look towards the future, I want to keep that on the forefront and remind the, the board that this is something that's important to us and uh, we do we, we do work lean and mean, as I said before, um, but it, it does have to take a toll and I can, I can keep the spirits up of the staff as uh, much as I can, but we, we do need some help. And then um, I did wanna point out that July is Parks and Recreation Month and that we have a number of events that we're trying to provide uh, free to the community. I showed the list of them here on this slide, but um, just one of the things that's really exciting to me is we're gonna do Get Your Play On here on July 28th at Simpkins and Shoreline. We're working with all of the parks departments in the county together to provide a sort of carnival activities, games um, type of feel for them to come out and just they can swim for free, participate in activities for free, very family oriented and um, uh, it'll be a great time. We also have the Parks and Recs which, uh, that bring out the dogs to the pool and last, last weekend in August, um, and then the Live Oak Family Fun Run, the movie at Highlands, as I mentioned. Um, 
And I also just want to take a moment and, and thank the CAO's office and the staff and, and Carlos, um, especially uh, during these tough times right now, that they've, the incredible support they've shown us and the help they've given us. And most importantly, um, I have an incredible staff and we're very fortunate that we have the group of people we do working for us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Are there questions or comments before we open up for the community on this item? Supervisor Caput. Uh, I want to thank you for all the interest and in, uh, all the uh, work you're putting in on, uh, you know, parks throughout the county and uh, activities that are going on. And uh, I know you've been working real hard to keep the costs down on some of the programs uh, because we do have a lower income part of the county that needs to be able to afford to go to different programs like aquatics and all that. So the prices are, are pretty good. Uh, is there a lot of pressure though to raise prices uh, that you're having to uh, actually fight off? Yeah, I think um, with everybody, uh, this economy, um, the cost of living, uh, I don't know how I'm going to joke about this. You talked about peanut butter. I don't know how Costco keeps a hot dog and a soda for a buck fifty. We we certainly have a hard time keeping things at the cost they need to be, um, that's and that's uh, uh, to some degree a, a lot of people in my profession, uh, myself to some degree included, believe these services should be free for our community, but they do have a cost, and it is very difficult in these times. So I, it's a, it's a daily struggle. And then, uh, like with the pub track and uh, Leo's Haven, those are all free, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Absolutely. I mean, that's uh, that's what we grew up. Uh, parks, you just went down there and played cats, Absolutely. or you went down there, and uh, you're not locked out. Uh, real quick on the pump track, uh, it's on schedule, and uh, uh, the bids are coming in. And so, how does it look right now? Starting date. Uh, we're hoping by mid-October it'll be open. That'd be great. It will be. You bet. I want to thank uh, Supervisor uh, Friend. We've been working on it. We're actually uh, both working on it because it's technically in his district uh, by the dividing line of uh, Green Valley Road. And uh, so it's going to be, uh, I, I guess what I was surprised by was when we had the first discussion, public discussion out at the site at Pinto Lake and uh, uh, all the people that showed up. It was on a Saturday morning and uh, there were parents and their kids were there and they brought bicycles just to look at it. And uh, it, it really, uh, it surprised me how many people you were there. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, it's something that when I was a kid, we didn't have pump tracks. I didn't, you know, now it's uh, actually very popular. I think when we had, we were kids, we had dirt lots and we had uh, orchards we used to be able to ride through, but those, we don't do that anymore. You so know. yeah, we have pump tracks now. Yeah. And uh, this one kind of surprised me. I saw the name Marmos. Do you know anything about Marmos? That used to, that's over there by Pino Lake. It used to be <coughs> privately owned by the Marmo family. And so I guess uh, now it's part of the uh, Santa Cruz County Parks in the last number of years. Okay. No. But it's, yeah. it's an affordable housing site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's an old, old name uh, that just kind of showed up here in the report. Oh, there we go. You bet. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I thank you for that presentation, uh, Mr. Gaffney. And I just want to say that I nicknamed you the Energizer Bunny. Uh, <laughs> and it, it just goes down throughout the staff. And you're to be really commended for revitalizing this parks department. We've had the opportunity to do it. It's been a fantastic job with the, with the limited resources that you have that we've been able to contribute more to. Uh, and I don't think uh, lean and green, or excuse me, uh, lean and mean is the right terminology. I think lean and green would be better. That is good. So, that is uh, yeah, good. okay. Uh, but I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate, and I'm going to focus on the fifth district of how much we've been able to, you've been able to accomplish, we all have, uh, throughout uh, g the purchase of the Bear Creek Park. Um, that, that was phenomenal as a cooperative effort with the Boulder Creek Recreation District and Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. It was a really uh, uh, 
a great project to have a lot of different agencies come together to make it a reality. And uh, I want to mention that there's a picnic, uh, a public picnic uh, this Saturday at 1 p.m. at Bear Creek Park in Boulder Creek. So uh, come out and enjoy it, uh, folks of uh, San Rosa Valley, especially those of the Upper Valley. Uh, it's a tremendous addition to that community. Yeah, the Founding um, Families picnic. Th yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, in Highlands Park, I, I saw the movie uh, yeah. night coming up J July 1st. and. Uh, and again, I can't say enough about the Felton Library Discovery Park combination, so to speak. Congratulations on getting that grant. Everybody, I tried to call s some folks to say th how important each of them played a part in that. Uh, it's, it's the first of its kind in the state, as far as I know, of having a, uh, an indoor library, a conventional library, and then an outdoor library for, to discover nature, so to speak. Uh, and it physically flows into it. It's beautiful. It's, it's amazing. It's going to be just a highlight, and I can't, there's a lot of people to thank, but Nancy Gert and Jim and Michelle Moser, Moser who are, uh, Jim is here, uh, they work night and day on this, and it's uh, a fantastic uh, addition to the valley, the lower valley in Felton, um, and it's a, another cooperative effort. Uh, it really is amazing when we can get our act together between some agencies and uh, how well it works. So thank you very much for your efforts and everybody and your staff. We're much appreciated, and uh, we're going upward and onward. Thank you for your leadership. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Gaffney. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing how much work gets done and how many people get served uh, by the small amount of money we actually give you. So uh, we're, I'm very aware uh, of the needs of the department. Uh, I'm glad that the investment that we made last year on, uh, for a volunteer coordinator has paid off handsomely yep. um, already. And uh, I think that will grow over time because we know that when we've gone out to the public and asked them for to support the parks, uh, they've shown overwhelming support. And, uh, and so there's a lot of love um, uh, for the county park system and getting people involved as a volunteer is, uh, is, is great. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, you, your staff, everybody involved for helping the, the SoCal Family Movie Night series uh, take off. You know, we'll be doing an, our second movie uh, this uh, tomorrow night. Yep. Um, we're going to be showing the Goonies. Uh, but it really uh, uh, lights up that heart of Soquel Park. Um, I, I heard a few people say this is the first time I've been there uh, because it's, it's tucked away there behind the post office. Um, but it's, a, it's been a long sought after uh, uh, amenity to <coughs> Soquel. And when combined with the, with the, the, the pathway, um, uh, that is going on. Um, it really uh, is the last major element of the SoCal Village Plan um, that was created many years ago, many years before I became supervisor. Uh, but the idea of linking up the different parts of, of, uh, of SoCal, this, uh, the pathway becomes incredibly important. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, at the SoCal School Board uh, when Cheryl Bailey and other members of the staff made a presentation of what it's going to look like. The, the school is, is giving us easement to their land um, as they do some reconstruction of SoCal Elementary. Uh, and it's going to just be a fabulous addition uh, to SoCal. And I just want to express my appreciation to you and your staff for the hard work that you did finding the money. Uh, I know you've written a, a number of grants. Uh, and when I see the grant totals uh, that, that the Parks Department has generated, um, uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I know that that takes a lot of time outside the regular work uh, day uh, for people to put into it. I know uh, Will and Cheryl and, and, and everybody else uh, puts a lot of time into it. I know we get help from some of our Parks Commissioners. Yes, um, absolutely. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to access some of those new funds from Prop 68. Um, with the the, the uh, success that we've had so far, it's really it's really made a difference in the par department. Um, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge the work that you did, and we'll be using again this year for the pickleball uh, uh, court at Bromer Park. You know, I go by there and I see people playing on that court all the time, uh, and uh, sometimes they reserve this spot, but it's just sometimes it's just people playing pickleball or uh, other games on that court. It's really, um, it's really been a welcome addition and uh, the board's gonna be going there again at the end of, of budgets for our pickleball tournament. 
Uh, Supervisor McPherson may give up the trophy. We're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to fight hard for it. A big pickle. <laughs> um, I also just want to express uh, uh, my appreciation to uh, Eric Strum and other people in uh, parks. Uh, you know, we had a spate of violence uh, happen on the Soquel Drive corridor. Uh, uh, the sheriff's department did a great job in terms of going there and capping the violence. But one thing that became very clear is that young people needed to have uh, better activities. Uh, so you and Mr. Strum um, immediately made Winkle Park available. I understand yesterday that there's going to be an ultimate Frisbee game uh, with staff, uh, with uh, some of the families over there, which I think is going to be fabulous. I know we've gotten some other activities and other nonprofits involved, but just the, the willingness to be a part in partnership with, um, with community-based organizations to, to address this. Uh, I know it's part of, you would see it as part of your mission, but I just want to express the appreciation for the community uh, that you made it available and, and working together we can help uh, make uh, the lives better of a lot of people. Uh, and Absolutely. I just uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we have the ongoing um, maintenance uh, challenges. Yeah. Uh, you know, last year we saw so many trees come down at Moran uh, Park. Um, uh, 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 Ms. Illiff uh, did a great job of, uh, of managing that, and we need to provide um, more money to, uh, yeah. to make sure that we can maintain our properties uh, very well. Um, lastly, I'll just say, uh, um, we're, uh, we're at a, a great point, I think, um, in the life of Chanticleer Park, a park that was assembled over many years through the Redevelopment Agency, which was planned and permitted uh, before the closure, before the elimination of redevelopment money, and we've been struggling with figuring out how we could actually build this park uh, for the most densely populated part of the unincorporated uh, county. And uh, these incredible uh, volunteers have stepped forward. Uh, Mariah Roberts, Trisha Potts, their entire families. Uh, they have engaged hundreds of volunteers uh, to contribute uh, a tremendous amount of money. Um, it's, hard to, it's, it, it's hard to adequately express my appreciation for volunteers who raise close to uh, $2 million. Um, that's, just, that's a level of, of community fundraising which we haven't seen in Live Oak, um, and we don't see too many places around Santa Cruz. Uh, and it, w it wasn't done with a bunch of big grants, it was done with a lot of small donations. Absolutely. And I think we're going to be challenged, and uh, when it comes to time, I'll be asking for help from our county administrative officer to figure out how we do our part to make sure that now that the community has weighed in uh, in such, such a big way, that we can complete this park, not just phase one, but the, the, uh, the entire park which has been long sought after, um, and we've seen this outpouring of support. So I, I, think, I think we have to do our part. Uh, but I, I want to express the appreciation to you, the staff, uh, Kim Namba, who, uh, who uh, has to figure out how to stretch those dollars as far as possible. And she still has all of her hair, so that's Absolutely. pretty good. <laughs> and she's able to manage me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Dreams. not sure about that. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, thank you for the work of the department. It's really appreciated in the community. Thank you. So if I one more. Uh, yeah, I mean, real briefly before uh, we get to hear from members of the community, but uh, one, I want to thank you for your commitment to making sure we have access for all people in our community uh, to our open spaces and our parks. It's, um, I look forward to working with you over the coming years to increase that access. Uh, second is that you mentioned it, uh, Twin Lakes is coming along. We're, we're so close yep. uh, to having this project finally done and I really look forward to activating it. Although it's, if you're out there, there's already uh, a lot of activation. Absolutely. Uh, but, but make sure we're coordinating with our programs. But uh, thank you for your work and your commitment. Thank uh, you. To our community. And we're getting you a bathroom in Davenport. <laughs> Promise that's gonna happen. All right. <laughs> that's already done. <laughs> Supervisor Caput, you got a follow-up? You bet. Uh, uh, just a quick commentary, and uh, we've talked about it, and you've actually been working on it with myself. But uh, uh, <clears throat> looking around the room, being older than most people here, uh, I think Bruce and I maybe are, are the two older ones. <laughs> <laughs> he has a trophy and you don't. <laughs> But when I was growing up uh, on the old black and white TV, uh, 
they they would have uh, commercial uh, public uh, comment uh, commentary and commercial that was showing kids going down to parks, and uh, they would be locked out. Uh, the parks would be locked out. It said, uh, "Please don't fence me out," uh, and there was to open up everything so. Uh, the public who pays for everything can actually use it. This is a sad commentary on what's happening today. Uh, if you drive around, we're seeing fences go up everywhere. It's kind of uh, ironic that no matter what a, a political uh, persuasion somebody has, but uh, when you have a major problem, they think about building a wall rather, rather than a bridge. So uh, it, uh, my kids' school, when I go there now, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there were no walls. Uh, now, if you go to that same school, uh, they have eight-foot fences all around, and it's locked up, and not only locked up during the school hours, but locked up during the uh, weekends. And in talking to the schools, of course, then they say, if we're going to unlock those fences and gates in the uh, weekend, we want money. It's all about money now, and that's really a sad commentary, and also bad things do happen, and then maybe there's an overreaction. I don't have a solution for it, but somehow we have to open up these uh, playgrounds, and we have to tear down those walls rather than building walls. But, uh, uh, and, and it's also talking about an, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, an atmosphere of education or an atmosphere of uh, public parks and school grounds, uh, if you look at it, uh, the, it gives off an impression uh, that it's like a prison. And uh, that's, not a, that's not a good environment. It's locked up, it has high fences, you have kind of, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's really not a, it's not a good way of, uh, you know, handling things. So anyway, what I, uh, what I'm getting at is we need more park space, we need more schools opened up uh, for kids to be able to go down there. We have to keep the costs down so we're not excluding lower income families. And uh, we have a big problem on our hands and uh, uh, I think we can come up better with better solutions than building walls. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Kevin. Just briefly, I just wanted to uh, also add my thanks to your staff, um, you know, Gretchen and Will and, and you and everybody on the team, including some of your recent retirements, have done remarkable work. Uh, the graph, the slide that shows how uh, the number of parks have gone up while the number of staff have gone down, um, you know, is very telling. And I think also we had a small infusion into uh, parks a couple of years ago and one-time uh, reimbursement funds from the state. and you made massive investments as a result of that. I mean, it, it really was interesting to see how parks really did get transformed. We, we were finally able to build a new park in, in my district, put that money, put it over the top. Um, significant improvements in, in uh, Supervisor Leopold's district, Supervisor McPherson's district, which shows to me that it doesn't take much of, it, of an investment in your department to have significant returns. And I, and I think that what uh, the board uh, has been looking to do, and, and I think that you've proven this under your leadership, but also your team's leadership, uh, is that we have a lot of deferred maintenance needs, but we're not too far off from addressing those needs if we could just give you that infusion. And we have a couple of parks that uh, would transform uh, opportunities for kids in this community that don't have opportunities that are right on the cusp and you just need that extra push. And I agree with Supervisor Leopold's uh, drive that it's that that's our responsibility. That's not your responsibility. Your your responsibility is to make it happen once we give you that funding. But uh, you know the board will work with the CAO to see uh, how we can do that. But I want the staff to know that we're, we recognize that that your department has been uh, significantly reduced. We recognize that you're doing more than one job at a time, uh, and we also recognize that our parks. Uh, even with that, uh, serve so many people on any given day, including my own family, every weekend, uh, and sometimes I pick up from school, it seems every day, we end up at a county park that has to be maintained by somebody that used to be somebody's, uh, that now those maintenance workers have been reduced significantly. So you're one of those departments that can do a lot with a little, but we, if we give you a little bit more, I think that, that uh, it, would, it would be transformative for the community and the next generation. I just want, uh, you know, you to be appreciated and acknowledged for the fact that we also recognize that we're not giving you enough right now. 
Um, we'd like to open it up for the community. It's a member opportunity for members of the community to address us on the parks budget. Good morning, welcome. Thank you all for waiting. <laughs> okay. I didn't bring my stool, but I'm glad Oliver brought his. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, you ready? <laughs> Oops. Okay. No. Now go for it. Good morning, Oliver. Oh, uh, contents. So, my name is Oliver Potts. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Waterville. I, I am seven years old. I will be eight years old on July 7th. I am the O in Leo's Haven. My sisters are the L and the E. Which is I'm doing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> My sister. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the Leo's Haven will be an inclusive playground where, where kids like me can play with their friends. My family. My mom has been working with this guy. <laughs> the fa the fa ha my family has been working with other people in the community, including you, raise m to raise money for Leo's Haven. I'm here to say thank you. Leo's Haven will be special playground where I can play with my friends. Which, yeah, and Sophia, sir, <laughs> Zoe, and Tyler. And Tyler and Manuel. Oh, and my sisters, Lauren and Evelyn. <laughs> All kids need to play. Thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Friend, I would be very, very worried about a future competition from, uh, <laughs> from Oliver wow. Potts. It's got my endorsement, but you lose votes with it, so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Clea Roberts, and I live in Live Oak. Since I can remember, my family, friends, and neighbors have been working to build Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park. Because of this work, I know that all kids, no matter if they have a disability or not, just want to play with their friends. I've met kids who speak different languages, kids who use wheelchairs, and kids who use long white canes to move around. Everyone wants the same things, to be accepted for who they are and have a place to belong. All kids want to be able, I want all kids to be able to play at Leo's Haven and we're almost there. Thank you for all your help and I hope you bring your ki kids or grandkids to play with us. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all of your partnership. We have a little ways to go. We do need a little more help, but we are pretty much there. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Morning, welcome. Good morning, that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm Michelle Williams, I'm Executive Director of Arts Council Santa Cruz County, and we are so grateful for our 39-year partnership with the county and what has become a particularly robust partnership with the Parks Department under Jeff's incredible leadership and the wonderful staff there. Our arts and our parks are a significant part of our quality of life. A few years ago, you in increased your investment in the arts, and as you've seen and experienced, hopefully for yourselves, the MA and the Arts Council worked with arts organizations and artists across the county to dramatically increase our programming and do incredible things that every day are making our county stronger. Much like the arts, I'm sorry, much like our parks, our arts touch every corner of this county. And last year, the Arts Council had an extraordinary year, granting $230,000 to artists and arts organizations countywide, uh, coordinating a really successful open studios art tour that created almost a million dollars in taxable art sales, an epic ebb and flow, and most importantly, we reached over 17,000 children through our arts education programs from the borders of Monterey to the far north mountains. And of course, doing really 
really great work at the Tannery Arts Center to enliven that as a heart for the arts for the entirety of Santa Cruz and the world. Uh, it's really extraordinary to be in partnership with all of you, both professionally and personally. I too have children who I take to just about every park in this county. And it is so important, not just for the beauty of this county, but for our physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual lives and selves. So I'm very grateful for our partnership with parks, very grateful for our partnership with all of you, and uh, grateful that we live in this extraordinary space filled with so much beauty. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your work. Good morning. Thanks for waiting. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, Jim Mosier from Felton. I just want to uh, speak briefly about the uh, work I'm speaking on behalf of the Felton Library Friends, the uh, wonderful uh, collaboration we've had with the county parks and with Jeff Gaffney's leadership in moving forward with the Felton uh, Nature Discovery Park. Um, uh, but I want to also say that it's been really terrific to work with the department and with Jeff and his staff uh, on a broader sense. The strategic planning process that they uh, engaged the community in was <coughs> very, very successful in our mind up in the valley. We had a huge turnout. We really appreciated the opportunity to have some input into what the priority should be for the parks department uh, and uh, to be heard in, <coughs> in, a, in a way that uh, doesn't often happen. So I just wanted to uh, express our thanks uh, to the staff and to Jeff uh, for uh, and being engaged with the community in the way they are and also having the volunteer program. We're looking forward uh, to be uh, active participants in that. Uh, we see uh, lots of opportunities with this new park for engaging the schools, uh, the <coughs> San Lorenzo Valley Water District, which is a partner in that park, and we really appreciate the partnership of the county and the particularly county parks department as well as the library. Um, so uh, in terms of the Discovery Park, we uh, really appreciate Will Fort's work on the grant proposal that was funded. We have, uh, new, we, we hope, a good substantial chunk of what we need for construction of this uh, really very innovative park. Uh, it'll be the first in the state. There are a couple around the country that have combined a library, uh, indoor learning with outdoor learning focused on environmental literacy, that what we have in mind, we think it's gonna be a model for not only uh, our community, but for the county and for the region and for the state. It's gonna be a model that other uh, communities are gonna look at very carefully. We think it'll be something that will be exciting for uh, all ages, but particularly for young people around the county. So thank you all, I wanted, I know I've got the yellow light on, I just wanna say I really wanna reinforce the messages that many of you already gave, which is, the Parks Department doesn't have enough money. <laughs> and we out in the community really appreciate the hard work the staff is doing with the limited resources. And I hope, uh, as with Leo's Haven, that uh, we can get over the finish line and that the county can help make that happen. And I want to express my appreciation to all five of you, but particularly to Supervisor McPherson for your hard work on this project in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Thanks morning, for Good morning, morning. I'm Jonathan Haken, Director of Development and Partnerships at the MA. Um, and I want to echo so many things that Michelle said. We're so grateful for your increased investment in the arts in the last few years and to Mr. Gaffney here for your leadership. I'm so grateful. It's been a big year at the MA. Um, since Abbott Square opened uh, just last September, uh, attendance to the museum has tripled. Um, more than 1,500 families in, um, in this county have become members of the MA. We've gone from two flagship programs a month to nearly two a day, um, and we're open seven days a week. We've expanded our pop-up museum program throughout the county in Watsonville and Davenport and Live Oak. It's been a huge uh, year, and we're increasingly becoming recognized as a global leader in creating organizations that are of, by, and for their communities. In fact, the reason Nina Simon isn't standing next to me right now is that she is in London keynoting um, Euro uh, Europe's largest museum conference in London, sharing this message of how to create inclusive, welcoming spaces. Um, and it, it's only been possible because of your support. And it's at, this work is just getting started, so, um, so I wanna thank you for your uh, ongoing support of the MA and the arts and the parks in this county. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. 
Becky Steinbrunner, resident of APCAS. Thank you for your report, Mr. Gaffney and Ms. Nambi, for your good work. Um, I always come with questions, <laughs> and I have questions um, because I like to look at the line item detail. Um, I'm kind of a detail person, as you know. So I have uh, some questions, and then I have some comments. And, and I wonder, in the uh, line item detail, where is it uh, registered the Quimby Act funds that developers must pay for park development as a result of their development. And um, also on page 506, I saw that there is a hundred and almost $155,000 for historic preservation. And I'd like to know um, where that comes from and how it will be spent or how it could be spent and how those funds are, um, analyzed for prioritized spending. And now my comments. Um, I was here at a Board of Supervisors meeting when Ms. Potts got up and, and you formally gave you know, the green light for the, the, sh the wonderful Chanticleer project. And I cannot thank her and all the volunteers enough for all of the very hard work. I know that it was not easy for them to enter into relationship with the county. And I remember you, uh, Supervisor Leopold, saying it was through her um, insistence that it happened. And I applaud members of the public like that for really pushing forward and then doing the hard work of raising the money like, like this group has done. So I want to come to you this morning with a similar insistent project, and it is at the Aptos Village project. When the post office jumps, world famous post office jumps, were bulldozed in 2015, Mr. Gaffney told me that he immediately received about a half a million dollars in pledges from people around the country, around the world, if they could be rebuilt somewhere. I propose to you that the Aptos Village Project Phase 2 could be returned to a bike jump and pervious paving to serve Nicene Mark State Park users. Nicene Marks has had to close to the visiting motor vehicle traffic eight times since the beginning of the year because there's just not enough parking inside the park since the informal dirt parking lot has gone away with construction. I want to propose to you that you enter in or allow us to or help us negotiate with a public-private partnership and let's ameliorate the proposed 8,000 cars a day that uh, senior traffic engineer Jack Sarayakov said the Aptos Village project will bring when occupied. Thank you. Please negotiate with us. We're willing to do the Thank legwork you, that these people have done as well. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it back uh, to the board or um, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. Thanks for the testimony. Our, our, when I see our partners at the Cultural uh, Council or the MA, uh, I know that we um, um, that we value that partnership, and I'm glad we're able to support it uh, because it's such an, a vibrant part of our community. Um, I would like to move the recommended actions for uh, parks, open space, and cultural services with an additional direction uh, to our county administrative officer to come back on last day with financing strategies so we can complete these projects that people have talked about, Discovery Park, Leo's Haven, Chanticleer Park, the Farm Park, and others. Um, I think it's, cr it's critically important uh, that w we um, meet the community when they, when they do the hard work, uh, and we need to figure out ways in which we can uh, support these activities. Uh, so I ask support from the board. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor uh, Caput. Additional questions, comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank I'm you. Thank you. I'm actually going to take a 10 minute break now. Uh, we'll come back at 10.25 as planning department gets set up for their budget item. Supervisors meeting and budget hearing. Uh, we have item eight, which is to approve the 2018-19 proposed budgets for the planning department, including housing funds and any supplemental budget materials as provided in the reference budget documents. We have the timeline, the proposed budget, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the consuming agreements list, and the errata. Ms. Loy, welcome back. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start off by highlighting the 
the strategic plan vision that you guys started um, and the CO's office led over the past year. And it's over to the right. Santa Cruz County is a healthy, safe, and more affordable community that is culturally diverse, economically inclusive, and environmentally vibrant. We feel that the planning department, our, our mission, our key missions directly support achievement of that vision. First, of course, is uh, through planning for and regulating the use of land and structures through policy planning, permit reviews, and enforcement processes. And those all work to preserve and improve homes, jobs, environment, and neighborhoods. We also engage in affordable housing and community development efforts to increase the supply of and access to affordable housing and community facilities serving lower income households. The, the, the highlights, the big picture numbers for the planning department and the housing funds are shown on this slide. The overall um, funding is on the order of 17 million. When you deduct the infra, infra fund transfers, our expenses are actually just about 12 and a half million. We, the budget reflects 2.3 million from in general fund support, about 10.3 is income earned from charges for services and permits. Also, the, the housing fund number, you know, that's a big number on the right, you know, 15 and a half million. We don't expect to necessarily spend it all, but it is a, appropriated and available should um, housing projects be identified and, and need that type of or, or level of support. And it also just gives you a good picture of the, the level of uh, housing funds that we have available. Um, this slide shows you, you know, a, a little bit of a historic perspective in the difference between general plan support. Um, the green bars show earlier years when the adopted budgets actually provided more general fund support than we ended up needing, you know, year after year after year. Um, lately, the, the converse has been true, where we've budgeted um, with less general fund support. Uh, tried to, you know, been fairly optimistic about permit revenues and haven't always achieved those. Um, and so have required, ended up requiring a bit more. But, you know, in, in some, the overall general plan support to the planning department has decreased about 50% from what it had been before the Great Recession. Um, we, some of the reason that's able to occur is we do have lower staffing levels. A greater proportion of our work is related to permits, and we have a great cost recovery rate. Um, again, a bit of a historical perspective. In, you know, about 15 years ago, the cost recovery rate in the planning department was 57%. The proposed budget reflects a cost recovery rate of 78%, which in my mind is about as good as it gets. Um, and given that we do staff public information and public counter and, and do a number of other things that don't directly result in revenue. So the net county cost has gone up about 20% over the past 15 years. Um, budget highlights, um, again, big picture. Um, we think because of the excellent cost recovery, um, we are not having to increase fees. We're holding them constant for the second year in a row. We are increasing funding somewhat. We're, we would have 70 funded positions and two unfunded. Um, the three, there's three positions that are being added, um, as you heard when you listened to the cannabis budget. So we will, through the cannabis effort, be adding a building inspector, a building plans checker, and a development review planner. Other than that, we're also adding uh, one and a half positions, half time position in development review, and then another building inspector. The cannabis staff will be added as required by workloads. Also just wanted to point out that, um, you know, that we always knew that, you know, with, through the recession we were doing layoffs and there, and even before that there wasn't a lot of turnover in staff. Um, but we knew that they, that it would eventually come. And so once the economy recovered, um, some, you know, some people retired, some people took positions elsewhere. Um, we've added some positions. So I wanted to point out that you know, by the time we fill these positions that we're proposing, almost 50% of the staff in the planning department um, is here for less than two years. That uh, was felt most dramatically a uh, year and a half or two ago by the building uh, section. Out of the six building inspectors, you know, five of them were new. And so I, I point that out just to, to um, 
appreciate the efforts of, of management staff and you know, also note how exciting it is to have you know, new energy and new skill sets and experience from other places coming into the department and it, it's been great. Uh, staffing levels, uh, again, a bit of a historic perspective. Um, since the Great Recession and the loss of the redevelopment agency, uh, we, we lost quite a bit of staff. We've recovered some of that, but we're still about 30% less staff than what our highest level was, which was just before the recession in 07 or 08. I'm going to focus on the permit center now. Um, you know, in 50% you know, less general fund support, 30% less staff, giving you a little bit of a historic perspective about workloads. The workload has not gone down, you know, commensurately. So um, we have about the same amount of staff now as in fiscal year 11-12. So that's the column on the left shows you the activity levels, some of the numbers in the different sections of the permit center. And then there's the middle column is, is this year. Um, and the difference and the percentage difference are in the right-hand columns. And I, I just, I, it, it's amazing really between our cost recovery rates and what staff is able to do, um, do more with less is, is really being demonstrated in the planning department. Um, we have benefited from the technology improvements that your board has supported and we have been worked on for many years. Uh, the training, the cross training, um, the new positions, um, great managers, great new staff. Um, so they're doing a great job and um, I just wanted to point out, you know, how much work is being done by the fewer people that we do have. The overall level of permits uh, center staffing is shown in this slide. Um, taking the building section as an example, um, 22 people altogether at the counter, plan checkers, um, um, manager, uh, inspectors, etc. We have six inspectors. And just in this past year, you know, some of the projects that have been happening, you're aware of. We've got the Rancho Del Mar, which is a major uh, new and rehabilitation project. We have Aptos Village, which is a, a, a big project. Pippin Apartments, 46 dwelling units, the Brookvale Lodge, Sheriff Detention Center, Winkle Avenue Subdivision, lots of uh, solar photovoltaic projects, the Roundtree Project, Janice, on and on. Those are some of the big projects that those six people are handling. And that's on top of just all of the regular normal additions and remodels and new houses here and there. So they have been doing an amazing job of keeping up with it all. And that is, however, why you know, we, we are proposing, you know, even aside from the cannabis activity that we anticipate, we do need another building inspector and that is in your supplemental budget. Uh, some of the enhancements that we've been able to make um, at the permit center, and this is, you know, kudos to, you know, Wanda Williams and Marty um, Heaney and uh, Steve Guinea, Jocelyn, Bob Colosino, the building counter supervisor, uh, Carolyn Burke in environmental. They've all been really working together as a great team and coming up continually trying to identify ways that we can improve our customer service delivery to the public. We, uh, just this past year, we opened the counter at 7.30 in the morning, um, particularly for contractors who were able to come in um, without the competition of other people, you know, trying to get it at, in at the counter and pick up their permits in a very efficient way. We've extended the counter hours. We used to close at three, now we close at four. We're still closed on Fridays. We're open Monday through Thursday. The electronic permit process, you know, it, and you guys have been very supportive of and promoting that. Um, I don't think we're hitting on all cylinders yet. We're, we, we do train, uh, offer some training to applicants. Um, uh, we're still working out kinks, but it is available and we are getting some activity in the electronic plan check and submittal and, and et cetera. Um, Wanda Williams, the Assistant Director for Development Review, she uh, spearheaded um, kind of reviving um, an interagency, interdepartmental management um, meeting. Or, or it's, a, it's a twice a month if needed, sometimes they're canceled, but managers from public works, environmental health, planning, building, 
fire if needed, in any of the agencies related to development review. And so they'll go over the aging lists, you know, what, what projects are lagging, uh, are taking too long beyond our, our goals. And, and try to troubleshoot and move things along. They'll also have um, highlighted on special topics so that, so that everybody can learn um, from each other and, and about important topics such as you know, water supply or new storm drainage requirements or whatever so that we're all conversant in each other's um, challenges and better able to assist each other and, and the public. Uh, the new challenges for the Permit Center. Um, you're aware of um, the, we've, in terms of development review, the hosted rental permits um, will be happen are happening right now. The Coastal Commission approved the hosted rental regulations on June 6th, and last Monday, June 18th, we opened the 90-day window for existing hosted rental operators to come in and get their permits. If there are fewer than 250 hosted rentals, then after September 17th, we will open to new hosted rental operators. So we'll have to wait and see uh, whether we reach that cap or not. The most significant challenge, um, as it was last year, but a different phase of activity, uh, relates to cannabis. So as you know, the regulations require that every cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, or distribution use requires a land use permit. Those are gonna be processed concurrently with a cannabis license applications, and so the planning department is working very closely with the cannabis licensing office. They're gonna be of great assistance in helping the uh, applicants with the pre-application, the getting ready um, stage of be preparing to submit the application to the planning department. Um, the Accessory dwelling units, um, we do hope that all of our efforts over this past year result in a lot more interest and applications for the building plan check and inspections of, of ADUs. Code compliance um, also will be coordinating with cannabis. We are, we have started using the administrative citations tool that was created and that has been very effective. So we are, um, we are planning even stronger use of the of the administrative citation. There's a, a, a warning that can be issued and then checking back, and if they haven't corrected, then they get a ticket, essentially, and they can get tickets every day, and the costs can really mount. So, so people have been responding to that uh, very well. It's been an effective tool. Also, as you, real, you, re, you recall, your board asked us to put on one of your agendas a list of potential abatement projects. Um, and we selected you know, some top priority feasible abatement projects and, and that's a pretty new activity as well. And so we're proceeding with some of those abatements with the funds that we had available. Lastly, on the Permit Center New Challenges, I wanna talk a bit about the limited immunity amnesty program. It's now available. Um, as you know, the county has offered construction legalization programs in the past to incentivize bringing unpermitted improvements into legality, but participation was limited because of current state law that requires all past work to meet current building codes to, in order to achieve legalization. So that's not feasible in many situations. Um, your board, um, in, the in, you know, in the interest of public safety and supporting availability of safe housing and structures continuing to be available, you, know, you, you, you took a leap and supported our idea of, trying to, uh, of offering a type of amnesty program. Um, the limited immunity amnesty program will offer special inspections and will offer building permits for existing unpermitted structures when we determine that full legalization is not possible, but we'll give building permits to support the needed habitability and safety improvements to a structure. And then structures that are upgraded through the LEAP to meet those minimum safety and habitability requirements will be given a, a certificate. And there's a, a picture on the, on the slide here of what their certificate um, is, is basically gonna look like. We've we worked together, we collaborated with county council's office um, and others to put uh, the structure around the program because it's, it's easier, it's easy to say, you know, let's just offer an amnesty program, but how you actually go about doing it and making it work um, is, another, is another matter. So we have published a program overview 
and, and guidance, uh, sort of step-by-step guidance for people who are interested in uh, participating in the LEAP. Um, one of the first steps is that they, they s complete an application and also into a, into a participation and indemnity agreement, um, sort of states the, the rules. And then th there's a special inspection done and there's a, a checklist and for the minimum habitability and safety requirements. And then we prepare um, basically a report. We, we tell them what actually absolutely needs to be done even if you don't continue to, to participate in the app because you have really imminent hazards. Um, otherwise, what needs to be done, and it's at their choice whether to continue or not to meet that minimum safety and habitability and what types of permits they need. Um, once those are carried out, then there's a, a <coughs> statement of acknowledgement regarding limited immunity for unimprovement unpermitted permits, and that is a recorded document on title, and it basically acknowledges what is remains unpermitted, but also acknowledges that it's a safe and habitable structure, and and we were are then going to be, when you achieve that certificate, that means that you're falling to the, the lowest level of code compliance. So if we get complaints, you know, we're, we're just not gonna take action because this is a LEAP cer uh, certificated structure, it's providing housing, it's safe, it's habitable, and we're not gonna enforce against it. So we think that will be quite a benefit um, to participants. Um, goals for next year, um, this portion of the presentation will um, primarily uh, talk about the major and special projects of the planning department. And um, you know, on the left, you're familiar because you took, participated in pretty much all of these uh, accomplishments, is the accessory dwelling units, the hosted rental regulations. We've completed the public participation and almost have drafts of the Pleasure Point Portola Drive vision guiding pr uh, principles and complete streets design. The cannabis regulations um, have been adopted. We prepared a draft EIR, uh, which was a big effort. We also prepared an EIR on the Santa Cruz Nissan project, uh, another big effort. We also prepared an EIR on the Mount Hermon Recreation project. However, that applicant withdrew it just prior to completion of that EIR. But I point that out just because that was also a lot of work. Um, and um, so we've been busy. The safety and climate change, um, that's been, something that I've talked to you about for multiple years in a row, um, updating the safety element and the geohazards and floods and, and that whole package. The reason for, some of the reason for the delay was close collaboration with Coastal Commission staff on um, what, how to handle development or improvements on coastal bluffs given climate change and sea level rise, et cetera. So the Coastal Commission continue, you know, put out some sea level rise guidance, and then they put out a couple different versions of residential adaptation guidance. We've been reading those, modifying our material, and I'm pleased to report that on Friday, uh, the initial study, uh, public review period, and all of those drafts are w are public. Those drafts will be public, and the, the the initial study public review process, uh, or review period starts this Friday, and it'll go through um, August 1st. And then we hope to be in public hearings um, before the Planning Commission and your board this, this fall, winter. Uh, goals for the coming year um, is to finish up the Seascape Beach Estates. We've, we've drafted the regulations, we've held the community meeting, we're working on that initial study and that will be a, a new overlay district and rezoning of, of properties in that s subdivision. The Sustainable Santa Cruz County and Code Mod, um, as you know, has been on pause, unfortunately, for several years due to um, not having the staff and having this other work going on. But we, um, now that you know, we've accomplished and we've gotten the list pared down in terms of what we're working on and we're hiring new staff, you know, we're very excited that we'll be able to really focus on that in the coming year. The P Pleasure Point Portola Drive and, and design guidelines is part of that package, but you will be able to see the, the work products um, that come of that effort. Um, so moving along uh, to the housing section, 
as you know, inadequate supply and high costs have led to a high level of public concern about the crisis in housing that we have. And so the next portion of this presentation will review various efforts being undertaken by the planning department to help address these concerns. You just recently um, authorized work and directed work on a number of near-term regulatory efforts, uh, including farm worker housing regulations, enhanced density bonus, modifying the mixed use regulations for affordable housing, a permanent room housing overlay district, and um, a modified process for initiating the R combining rezonings and examining fees to look for ways that those might be able to come down. We are uh, participating in the housing task force um, in terms of exploring whether or not a local um, housing ballot measure, um, what, what that might look like that the voters might be able to, to vote on. Um, the, we are collaborating with the Health Services Agency on uh, No Place Like Home. There's a technical assistance grant that they're interfunding, transferring to us, and we will be working with them. And that's all about getting ready to compete for grant funds um, soon for permanent supportive housing um, projects. Seascape Lot A will be working with um, the Public Works Department Real Property to dispose of that with the proceeds to be used for future affordable housing activities. <laughs> The new affordable housing projects that will be going on, you know, work, working on in the coming year, the Habitat Harper project, um, it's, as, as you know, from 10 to 12 units, it's not quite clear how, how that will uh, finally settle out, but that is a project that will be going through the development review process this year. Also the successor agency disposition site at 17th and Capitola. Mid Penn is working on a project there. At this point, the initial proposal, uh, their concept is 66 affordable rental units proposed in a mixed use type of project. Uh, the planning department continues, uh, at the present time at least, to be the lead agency for the countywide continuum of care for, for homeless funding from HUD. And so we remain active uh, in the Housing Action Partnership and the Executive Committee and really appreciate the collaboration that's been going on this past year in particular with the CAO's office, Human Services, Health Services, um, and, and throughout the county in terms of uh, steering and prioritizing our homelessness efforts. So in closing, um, I just want to offer my, my thanks to the staff of the planning department. There really have been a lot of changes and there's more to come. You know, that, it's a constant that there's always change. And we've weathered staff reductions. We've managed doing more with, uh, with less in a way that has not compromised quality and customer service. Um, but it, it's exciting. We've made some wonderful new hires. Um, the team is expanding and there's a lot of great work to be done. And I know the planning staff, um, you know, the, the type of people and, and what drives them is, I know they're all going to continue to do a great job on behalf of the applicants and the community. I value and appreciate their work um, so much and I know the community does as well. Also wanted to take the opportunity to, to thank the citizens that serve on the commissions that we staff. Um, you know, the Planning Commission does yeoman's work. The Housing Advisory Commission is, has uh, been hosted a public forum on the housing crisis. We've got the Historic Commission, the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission, Committee, the Commission on the Environment. So all of those, you know, there's, there's a lot of public citizens that, that volunteer and give of their time, energy, and intelligence to try to make our community a better place. And we really appreciate working with them, and I wanted to give them a, a shout out uh, for their efforts. And then lastly, um, in terms of special thanks, um, of course I need to thank Nancy McCollum. She doesn't know this, but I consider her like the budget ninja. And I mean, she's so quick and flexible. You know, you need any data or information, it's, it's there. And um, it's, I don't know what we'd do without her. And you know, a Amy is, um, is her partner in that. And I appreciate um, Amy Wilbanks um, really continuing to, to grow and learn and be just, you know, right there as well with Nancy. Um, Wanda uh, Williams, the Assistant Director for Development Review, I also want to give a, a special thanks to. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the, 
the many years that she has also served as being the zoning administrator, which is, you know, she was, it, it's a big role to be the assistant director of development review and take on the, the zoning administrator. So she just recently, I don't know if you know this, but I think she just recently passed on the baton. Um, and so uh, the development review principal planners, Steve Guinea and Jocelyn Drake are, are both being uh, ZA. We may even having, depending on the level of cannabis activity, it may be that we end up having weekly ZA meetings and they're, they both be pressed into even more service. But uh, thank you to, to Wanda. Really, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and thank all the managers, all the staff for the, for the great work they do. Um, so thank you. And also, of course, to, to you and for your support and your engagement in the, the complex, you know, tricky items that we bring to you. I appreciate the, the homework you do, um, the, the, the seriousness with which you, you prepare and execute your duties is really appreciated. Um, it doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens here for sure. So thank you. And also, of course, the CIO, thank you for your support and particularly in the CEO's office, Melody Serino. She is not only, you know, deputy CAO, she's also our, um, our not an analyst, because she's not an analyst anymore, but she, she's so supportive and so easy to work with and uh, can't say enough about working with Melody, so thanks to her too. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, the last slide is the recommendation that you have before you. Thank you for that presentation. We'll open up for board questions and comments. Are there board members that would like to make question or comments? Sure. Supervisor Caput. Uh, yeah, I want to th uh, thank the staff too and also the board. Uh, we've made things a lot more streamlined when it comes to uh, farm use and uh, what they can do and can't do and uh, how many hurdles that they have to jump through. There are a lot less now than there was before. Uh, that could be on signage that they have uh, uh, advertising maybe for farm workers that they're shortage. Uh, the, there were a lot of rules they had to jump through. There was also the uh, uh, fruit stands uh, were making it more possible. Uh, and then also uh, uh, tractor and barn storage use uh, right uh, in the past. You couldn't even park the uh, uh, farm tractor in the uh, barn, barn at night, because I guess the rule was that they thought maybe you could be working and actually doing uh, uh, work on different tractors and running a business out of the barn. I, I don't know, that was the reasoning. But now they can put a tractor in the barn, they could store it there, and they can actually fix it there uh, they can't run a business out of there, but they can fix their tractor on site rather than having it transported somewhere. Uh, they can also, uh, I believe, have a water sink in the uh, barn also to wash their hands after they're done working. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of little things that were hindering uh, uh, improvements and making things easier. Um, and also home improvements up to, what, 50%. It's more streamlined now today than it was uh, about four or five <coughs> years ago. Am I correct on all these? Yes, we've, we've implemented a number of improvements and we've also identified a whole package more of, of improvements that still need to get into our code. But to the extent that we have drafted up regs, we, we are using those as guidance as we do um, review permits um, these days. So. Sure, and uh, farm stays and things like that. Uh, so you, you've been doing a lot of a lot of different th uh, things, making it easier and taking stress off of uh, ag land and uh, uh, you know farm owners. And so I think uh, I just want to commend uh, you know your staff for looking into that and having neighborhood meetings out in my area. District 4 for people to know what's going on. Uh, it shows people that we're listening to them and we hear their complaints and some of them we can uh, make it easier and some we can't. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> and I, I still don't know <clears throat> one uh, specific case that stood out. <clears throat> uh, 80 year old uh, plus a uh, gentleman lived in a house on his uh, farm. Actually, it was more timberland. And then his barn was down below, and every day he'd go down to the barn 
and he had a sofa there and he had a TV and just local channels. And uh, then he had also a, uh, uh, he'd like to spend the day after he got up and spend it down at the, in the barn. So I guess he got in an argument with one of the neighbors and they turned him in saying that he was actually living in the barn. And technically it was illegal at the time. And uh, he was like, I've been doing this for years, you know, staying all day down in the barn rather than in staying in the house. So if we, when, when you get a complaint like that, Court enfo code enforcement. Uh, what do we tell the, that gentleman now compared to what it was uh, about five years ago? Well, I haven't heard that story, um, and I don't know when it occurred. But uh, I don't think we, if I if I had heard it, I would not have initiated code compliance because I agree that um, someone could walk down to their barn and watch TV and hang out in their barn without it being a code violation. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe they did some wiring and improvements without a permit, that's another matter, but simply spending time in the barn um, is not a violation. Yeah, I went down there, it was worked out, but it was more complicated then than it is today. Uh, the neighbor who got angry was saying he was living down there. Right. You know, and there was a sink there in the barn, but uh, now the sink is okay and maybe before it wasn't, right? Right. So it might just be a matter that no permits were obtained for any of that and he was turned in for not getting permits. But yes, you can get permits for a sink in a barn and you, and you can you know, bring wiring to it, et cetera. What turns it into a, a, a dwelling unit is when you have a full kitchen. And so that would be really the sign that's of, right. of yeah. it become, yeah. having become a dwelling unit. Sure, and then uh, that's where the immunity code and certification might come in? Uh, if, you know, if there's an unpermitted dwelling that someone, um, that, that the county and the property owner, you know, we, we talk it over, we look at it, and we, we agree that it can't be brought into legality, but that it can be made safe and habitable, um, then yes, it would be possible to get a list of what you would need to do to a structure to get a LEAP certificate and allow it to be occupied. Um, as long as it's safe and habitable. So we do, we've developed a checklist that will be used on the special inspections where it doesn't necessarily require all current code requirements be met, but it does require, you know, some very important safety features in terms of, you know, CO and smoke detectors and uh, P traps and grounded wires and, you know, all of the things that you do need to make it safe to live in a structure. But uh, the, yeah, there is potential for all kinds of of situations to be um, certif get, gain a certificate under the LEAP. And uh, I guess the other last question would be uh, <coughs> currently, uh, uh, what would you say the percentage of code violations are actually complaint driven uh, by either a neighbor or somebody other than uh, just code enforcement uh, officials driving around? Nearly 100 percent. You know, we yeah. pretty much operate on a complaint basis. Um, we, the building inspectors, as they're just driving around, if they see, you know, active construction going on with fresh two-by-fours and, and they realize that there's no permit, then they'll post a stop work notice. You know, that's not necessarily a, a code compliance. I mean, it is a code compliance case, but it's stop work. You can't work on this anymore. C come in and get your building permit. So that's probably the most frequent type of proactive code compliance that's not based on a complaint, that's just based on driving around, is stop work orders. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Have it, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I think... Um, as I've mentioned sometime before, I think uh, this is the biggest changing environment we have in the county government. This is a new era when we've gone through decades of uh, growth control mentality and not bad, good or indifferent, uh, but now to what can we do to meet the housing crisis that's upon us right now? And all the implications that have on our water use, and our transportation and so forth. Uh, the planning department, which is probably uh, in some respect, the most important local government oversight that we have as a county 
And it's somewhat troubling to me in my last uh, CSAC meeting that I saw where the state is trying to get into, say, counties, this is what you have to do to provide more housing uh, throughout the state because the state's not meeting its obligation of what it sees about 180,000 units a year. And they're only, we're only building 100,000. So counties, how do you do that? Um, it's something that um, I just want to keep an eye on the law. And it's, uh, it was a concern to uh, CSAC when, in our last uh, legislative conference. Um, I just want, I th I'm really pleased to see that uh, there's no fee increases in included. As we try to meet this crisis, uh, we are going to need the help of the construction industry to provide the adequate housing for people in Santa Cruz County. Um, and my hat's off to you, what you're able to do. Uh, as you talked about the uh, turnover, and half your staff is here less than two years. But um, I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, and it's, it's a learning curve that's pretty steep right now, I'm sure, for all of them. And we have some, um, some ordinances that are probably a little different from many other counties. But not only that is that we're, we have to oversee so many new developments, if that's the right term. I mean, ADUs, tiny homes, hosted rentals, uh, concern over climate change, all these, and of course, cannabis. Um, it's a big, big bucket of, of ideas that we ha you have to, in the planning department, and we as a county have to deal with. So my hat's off to you to getting ahead of it very well, I think, and I, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. I, I hope that we get uh, more folks um, participate in this limited immunity uh, amnesty program. Um, I mean, it's, um, I understand, you know, the, the reputation from years past is the planning department gets in the way, and so people do it themselves, but there are some uh, unpermitted, um, in, in my district as well, uh, add-ons that have happened, and uh, it's really critical for public safety uh, uh, that people participate this and see that uh, we, we have uh, legal, safe housing additions that have been done without adequate permits. I would just uh, encourage the public to uh, please try to cooperate with us, with the planning department, in making that uh, a safer place for everybody in Santa Cruz County because particularly in the Santa Rosa Valley, one bar bad explosion could really, uh, well, I hate to think about it. Um, so I just really encourage folks to participate in that and I really uh, appreciate your taking that on in the planning department. Um, you've um, done a lot of things and had to adjust and innovate in some respects, some things, and I think you've really done a very good job. So I thank you and everybody in your planning department for getting in position to meet the challenges, to provide more adequate housing for the people of Santa Cruz County, um, they, uh, especially the, in the rental area, rental units. Um, we all recognize that's a big need here, but thank you for everything that you do in your planning department. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Good morning. Uh, yes, yeah, still good morning. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you. Uh, the, in working with your department, we always find you very responsive uh, and easy to work with and um, really committed to providing good service to the community. Uh, and I also wanna say um, your, uh, over the, the couple years I've been here, your um, commitment to outcomes and goals um, has built, really been remarkable. You're one of the best departments in terms of providing clear goals uh, in, in the budget um, this year and uh, really a model for a lot of other departments. And so um, the, the direction you've moved, been moving is great. When you look at the numbers of uh, permit applications and your staffing levels, um, it's, it's challenging and technology can help, uh, but I think um, really having the department get on the cutting edge of the continuous improvement efforts to figure out what is really necessary, what goes to the core of your mission versus what is paperwork or the way that we've always done things, how can we uh, can can we meet standards in a different way? Because uh, I think um, you know, uh, asking whether your staff is new or not, asking them to keep up with that level of work uh, in a way that that is 
good for them and the applicants uh, is, uh, is gonna be a challenge. So I think really looking at every process and trying to figure out what's the end goal and then working backwards from there and seeing if we can do things differently uh, and coming to us or to the CAO's office for the, for the, for the changes or resources necessary to make those, to make those changes I think, I think would be a benefit. Um, but, uh, but I wanna thank you for your, uh, for your collaboration and your real commitment to, to customer service uh, and the plan department. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, wanna express my thanks uh, to staff. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been going on in the first district. Uh, 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 Ms. Levine was involved with our pleasure point planning process, which I thought was, um, there was a lot of suspicions at the front end of that process. And I think pe well, by the end of it, people, people felt like their, um, their concerns were actually reflected in the outcomes, and I think that that's a good public process, um, and it took a lot of work, um, and I, I appreciate the work of the staff to help make that happen. Um, the Nissan EIR was uh, w was pretty thorough, um, and we were criticized. I was criticized because we had it done by staff rather than consultants, as if consultants were somehow better than. Staff, I, I feel like staff was more responsible, um, and I thought it was a it was a strong document that provided us with good information, um, and it was a, uh, it was a difficult decision, but uh, but it was helpful to have that kind of uh, information. So I appreciate the work the staff put into that. Um, uh, Matt Johnston uh, has taken over uh, for code enforcement. I, I thought it would be hard to replace Robin Bolster Grant. She did a great job. Uh, Matt has been very responsive. Um, to uh, the needs of our office, and I appreciate that. And the same thing with Marty Heaney, who's uh, as and, and building inspection has has been there uh, to address concerns that have been brought up by constituents. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, Steve Guinea is also uh, very helpful to be at my staff on the development applications to review what's going on, and he, he's very useful. Uh, and providing information to help us understand what's what kind of development activity is going on in the first district. So I thank you for that. Um, the uh, there's lots of other planners that we that we work with. I could go through a, a whole bunch, um, but you know we have some complicated projects. Uh, we uh, in as the most urban part of the unincorporated area, we have lots of different kinds of projects, and uh, we depend on the planning staff to be able to. Uh, uh, to balance a lot of different needs, and uh, I think they've been doing a good job. Um, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Uh, one in your presentation, we talked about the additional cannabis staff, which I, uh, which I have supported, and I'm trying to get a sense from you uh, when the Cannabis Licensing Office um, uh, made a presentation here on Monday, um, they estimated, and that's all we could do, uh, is that we might have 150 cultivation licenses and 75 manufacturing licenses. So the three additional staff, there's, are, I imagine that they'll work on those, but um, I, I can't tell, uh, and maybe you, you can share with me, whether that level of work can be handled by three people or should we expect that there will be other people in planning who will also be working on that? Right. I, so. That's our best guess in terms of where to start in terms of adding staff. Um, nobody quite knows how what how this is all going to unfold. I mean, I think you heard Robin Bolster Grant say that you know we anticipate a trickle at first, not a deluge, and so we're gearing up. They're trying to get people ready. We will add staff as needed, but even though we do add three staff, it's not going to be just those three only doing cannabis. So, in you know, we're sort of hopeful that. They will be able to do, there's a net gain in terms of being able to do, keep up with the cannabis stuff, but also do a better job um, with time frames and reviewing other flavors of permits as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's really hard. It really just depends on the nature of what actually comes in, whether they're, st you know, level three staff administrative type things, or they need, do they all need a public hearing by the ZA? How complicated are they? Is there any, there issues to work through, or is there fairly straightforward going into existing buildings? Are they, is a lot of uh, going into 
greenhouses in, in ag, you know, that should be fairly straightforward. So, um, you know, the controversial ones where the public, you know, doesn't like what's being proposed, those always end up taking the most time um, and care and a deliberative democratic process to decide what happens at the end. Um, so if we get a lot of those, then it will be challenging just with three people. Yeah. Well, I think what the, it, it'll be interesting as the year progresses where what happens with this, and I'm glad we're providing extra resources because I think it's gonna, um, it has the potential to be, create a, a big impact. Yeah. Um, uh, I was happy to, to hear you mention the use of the abatement funds. Uh, I know that they've been very helpful uh, in my district uh, with a problem property up in the summit area. Um, uh, do we have enough money in that fund? We've got enough for this year for the for the projects that you authorized, but but after that, that pot's empty. You know, it's. I think we are planning on spending on the order of close to 150. Yeah, um, I think something it's 140, on that order. thousand dollars. And we've had that money kind of hovering around in, in that fund. Um, I don't know if you remember, but last year through the budget time, we sort of consolidated the different flavors of abatement and, and enforcement funding we had. So we put it all into one pot and made it a lot more flexible with respect to how to use it. So that's why we've we've got that whole amount available for the types of abatement activities that we'll be doing. Um, but I think next year, you're, you know, if you want to continue that same amount of activity, we'll, we'll need to replenish that and that'll be new funding. Spoil alert for the CAO, yeah. something to think about <laughs> in the future. Um, uh, the limited immunity uh, program sounds good. I'd be, uh, I would uh, welcome just get receiving the materials on it so I can share it with my constituents uh, uh, use of, of that. You know, uh, we've talked here before about the, the sequel review process for the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Um, Every year we're up here, it's, it's a slightly different story about where we're, what we're doing with it. The, the last time we were looked at the budget, the, uh, the concept was that we were going to have a consultant do an RFP and, uh, to help develop the EIR. Uh, and now we're back to using staff resources, and I'm just, I'm but just trying to figure out. Um, I, 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 uh, I completely understand where you're coming yeah. from. It's been a moving target, you know, year after year. Um, last year, you know, we, well, first of all, we, we've, we've switched to, we want to issue an RFP and get an EIR consultant. Obviously, staff will be part of that team working right along with the consultant. We always are on any consultant effort. Last year, we thought we would have the RFP out and have an EIR consultant hired by now, and that was largely premised on the fact that we thought that we'd have that the vacant sustainability principal planner position filled. Um, we had made a job offer; they were going to report to work um, last fall, you know, August or so. Um, that person never did was able to, you know, had had certain issues, and we ended up having to open recruitment all over again. And in fact, we're not filling that position until next Monday. We have a new principal planner starting next Monday. Uh, we've also had a couple other. We've had a vacancy in that section. We we just filled in April. Uh, Daisy Allen is, has joined us, and she's got a great skill set. We are in the process of making an offer to someone else to backfill Sarah Noisy's uh, position. She she just left. So we've really struggled. We we haven't been able to make progress on that effort, other than the Pleasure Point. Um, and Portola Drive effort, which is sort of part of it. We've, we've continued to work with MIG, that consultant, and we've continued to have some level of staff work on um, the work products, but we haven't been able to make much project, frankly, because of the other things and the lack of staff. So with the fact that we've successfully recruited some talent and they're, they're showing up, um, including the new housing planner that you've authorized, that person is going to start work on July 9th. So we're, we're very excited that we're getting certain things done. We've got a team, and I gave you in the budget uh, staff report a tentative timeline for how we currently anticipate that going. And, you know, there's always the temptation to, to expedite it, you know, you know, let's get it done as soon as we can. But I, I actually, you know, you'll see that that timeline provide there's another couple years plus worth of activity and and the reason is is that it is a it's a major effort it's a it's a general plan update um, very substantive it's a code modernization very substantive we're doing an environmental impact report the community um, 
will want and deserves um, a lot of public meetings to really grasp what the final proposals are and what the EIR says about them. Uh, I expect that there will be multiple Planning Commission public hearings, um, maybe multiple board hearings. If you change anything, they have to go back to the Planning Commission. So it just takes time to do it right. Uh, but I think, you know, as your comment about the, the Nissan EIR, um, it, it pays off to do it right because you've got the information for decision making and you've got a defensible action at the end of the day when you do take it. So um, I do, you know, I feel just like you, I, I wish we would have been able to make more progress um, and, and I really do think that this coming year we will. Yeah, well, I, 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 um, uh, I'll, I'll try to remain hopeful. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, um, I feel like the groom waiting at the altar, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that, uh, for this project, and I just think um, uh, we, there's so much that we deal with that uh, that seems to hinge on this new development pattern. Um, that uh, we're we're making these efforts around the edges, but we but we have these <laughs> these big pieces that could make a big difference in the lives of so many people. And so, um, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to get it across the the, the, the finish line. We agree. We, we really do. Um, the, in your presentation, um, you talked about a greater part of the work is related to permits, mm -hmm. um, and you definitely had the data to show that. And um, uh, uh, my colleague mentioned that you set goals in your department, and he appreciated that. And you'd set a goal for permit processing, and we're not meeting that goal right Correct. now. Correct. And filling these extra positions or and, and other pieces, do you think we're gonna get closer to meeting that goal? I mean, do you have some sense about it or should that be not be an expectation we have? The, the permit processing is what we get a lot of uh, complaint. I'm sure my other co colleagues also get calls, concern. I've been trying to get my project done. It's stuck in, in planning. How long is it gonna take? Can you help me out? I think that it, that we will have the opportunity to improve and you know, having another building inspector, having another plan checker available for Cannabis Plus um, will really be helpful. We do, in, we are engaged in the continuous process improvement um, um, effort and like I say, the, the managers meeting, the interagency, interdepartmental managers meeting, you know, one of the first things on those agenda is the aging lists, you know, what are some problem projects or what are some comments that don't seem to be getting D dressed and you know how can we creatively approach this and, and get this moving along and so that has been very helpful um, so you know we think that it that we can do better and we hope that we will do better I don't know I can't guarantee you that we're going to make that you know one day turnaround or that one week you know turnaround um, but I think the, the increased staff is really going to help yeah, well, uh, I, I I appreciate that, and I understand staffing um, has been low, and so I'm glad to see that there's new staff coming on board. And uh, I will ask the support of my colleagues to get a mid-year report on on how we're doing and about meeting those permit processing goals, because I think it'll be helpful for us to to know where that is uh, and keep it on the front burner, because that is the main way in which so many people in the community interact with the planning department. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. I'll, I'll add uh, just some brief comments, and that is, uh, I mean, the, the board has done a lot of thanking of uh, your staff, but I think that um, many in the community might recognize that as the economy has rebounded and as uh, some of the issues in the community become more acute, especially around uh, affordable housing, uh, and state and federal laws have changed around both housing and even the telecommunications industry, the things that are coming forward to your body, to your department, and to the ZA and others are much more complex than they've been historically, and in many respects, much more controversial. And I feel like you have done a very good job guiding through that process, as has council in this regard in guiding the board and, and others. But a significant amount of the responsibility um, could be viewed as a burden, but I would view it as opportunity and responsibility of what will happen in the future of this county really lies within your department uh, in setting the uh, framework by which we will meet the needs for uh, our community over the next 30 years. Um, and uh, Julie and Wanda and others, I mean, you, you deal with this every single day, uh, but you've been given an opportunity at this point in time that's very unique. I mean, it's a very consequential time in history. and, and uh, 
and I think the board recognizes that we've been trying to do everything we can on the policy side, but from the implementation side and an interface side, a lot of it falls on your staff. Uh, and we see that. And I just want to make sure that you know that we recognize, we recognize it's going to be complex, we recognize some of these items might be controversial, but we do legitimately appreciate uh, the work that you're doing in the transition time between now and hopefully whoever's sitting in these seats at some point in the future uh, will be appreciative of the work that the previous board and planning department did for them so that their challenges they face are different than the challenges we face today, which is really what planning is in your name to actually do. Thank you. Uh, so we'll open it up. For the community, now is an opportunity for you to address us on items specifically associated with the budgets for the planning department, item eight. Anybody like to address us? Thank you, good morning. Becky Steinbruner, resident of Aptos. Thank you for the good report, Ms. Prevacic. I appreciate that very much. I do have an idea regarding the, um, the amnesty program. Why, uh, and I would like discussion about this if uh, why not have bring back the uh, Citizen Building and Fire Code Appeals Board that did exist in this county, was composed of industry professionals that would have great, had great expertise in coming up with alternate materials and methods, and that would take the pressure off the planning department, and then you could work on the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. <laughs> um, that was a, a terrific group of people, and your board obliterated that board, and I think it needs to be brought back. I want to offer that as my first um, issue and a call for discussion about that this morning. Second of all, um, I really feel that the whole issue of code modernization has been, um, had an end run about it. Um, the term Measure J was eliminated from the housing element, and um, I, I'm concerned that there are big changes in the zoning changes as came up before your board last Tuesday. Without the proper level of environmental review and public notification, um, and I think you really have opened yourself up to some sequel litigation. Thirdly, I want to just uh, weigh in about the um, difficult issue of historic preservation. This county claims it is very supportive of that, but it is not um, walking the talk. In many instances, um, the par each term partial demolition has been used misleadingly and led to a complete demolition of an historic building. The last building in the Heen subdivision in the Aptos Village project was completely demolished and it was called partial demolition. There's also the issue of uh, demolition by neglect that is happening before our very eyes at the Redmond Hirahara place down in Watsonville. That is a county property and um, it, the county is standing by and letting that place fall apart and that is a shame because there's a huge story behind that and it needs to be preserved. Um, number four, um, I would like to ask that the Housing Advisory Commission uh, be uh, required to be video recorded or audio recorded. Um, they only take action minutes, as all commissions now do, even your board, and that does not provide for the public the critical discussion that goes on in those meetings if you can't attend them in the middle of the day on a weekday. I would also like to ask that they be de required to declare ex parte communication, and uh, there is no recording available for the public of the zoning administrator hearings. I would like that changed. Um, Two, two, two requests. Uh, I want to know where in the line item it shows appeal fees. Thank you. And where, why is the in lieu development thank fee you, zero? Stumper. Okay, thank you. In lieu much. development fee zero thank for you. affordable housing. Thank you thank very you. much. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during this item? Okay, we're seeing none. We'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, I'll move the recommended action, but it sounded like you had additional direction for a report back. Yeah, I'd just like a report back at our first meeting in January about uh, 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 where we are with uh, meeting our established goals for uh, permit processing. So I'll, I'll, I'll move the recommended action with that additional direction. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to item nine, which is to consider the 2018-19 proposed budgets of public works, including any supplemental budget materials. We have the 2017-18 public works goals and accomplishments, the proposed budget, the supplemental budget, the line item detail, the unified fee schedule, the continuing agreements list, and the errata 
And we have a presentation from our new Deputy CAO and Head of Public Works, Mr. Machado, welcome. Can you confirm the microphone's on? It, it, oh. You might need to get close to it. It wasn't on. Okay. It's on now. That's all right. Let me start over. Good morning, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Supervisors, Mr. Palacios, Ms. Miller. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. I'm the Director of Public Works and your newest Deputy CAO. My presentation for the Department of Public Works uh, will include some of our 1718 accomplishments a 2018-19 budget summary, our proposed staffing changes, some of our 18-19 goal highlights, some of our future challenges, and some of our unmet needs. In our administration division, we redesigned our capital improvement program book. We successfully tracked and administered storm damage funds. In our capital projects division, we completed project oversight of state grant funded round tree rehabilitation and re-entry project for the Sheriff's Department. And we have nearly completed our Twin Lakes Beachfront Coastal Access Improvement Project. In fact, paving is occurring this week and by Friday we should have it completely open for public access, which is great news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> In our transportation division, we completed repair work on Valencia Road, Soquel San Jose Road, Glenwood Drive, and Soquel Drive. All of these projects were a part of our emergency storm damage repairs. We awarded a contract for the voter approved Measure D pavement management program. Uh, I will share a bit more about that in upcoming slides. In our special services division, we negotiated and award a new recycling and solid waste franchise agreement. We upgraded rain and stream gauges to ensure accurate rain monitoring and prediction of flooding for the county. <clears throat> Our proposed 2018-19 budget summary is as follows. Our budget is divided into three areas of responsibility. <clears throat> uh, the administrative services with a budget of $50,187,554 includes our fiscal team who provides accounting and reporting for more than 80 public works budgets, also including our program administration who is responsible for the overall budget, our county CIP, 36 county service areas, our parking program and our fleet management. <clears throat> our transportation group with a budget of $54,571,346 includes our road, de road design, our road operations, our survey department, our development review, and transportation planning. In special, in special services with a budget of $32,051,086, it includes our sanitation engineering, stormwater management, flood control, engineering, recycling and solid waste, and construction management for a total Department of Public Works budget of $136,809,986. <clears throat> Our proposed staffing changes include the addition of one accountant analyst, one IT applications developer, two solid waste coordinators, and one principal planner in solid waste. This is for a total of five new positions, <clears throat> resulting in a total employee number of 266 full-time employees plus three part-time employees. So a bit about our goal highlights, just a few of them. I will start with our Measure D project. <clears throat> this project is, uh, has been awarded. Construction will begin this summer. We anticipate completion this fall. And I would like to highlight um, some of the areas that you see on this slide. In District 1, we will be resurfacing Miller Road and the Miller Cutoff. In District 2, we will be, um, we will be resurfacing uh, roads in the area of La Selva Beach. In District 3, we'll be resurfacing Martin Road in the area of Bonnie Dune. In District 4, we actually completed that uh, project 
this current fiscal year, it was the replacement of the Casserly Road Bridge, uh, and that was a completed project for Measure D. And then in District 5, we are resurfacing a uh, number of roads in the Boulder Creek area. Some highlights in our Capital Projects Division. We plan to complete construction of the Behavioral Health Office building. We plan to start the Felton Library construction project and to begin construction of the La Selva Beach and Boulder Creek branch libraries. We plan to complete preliminary design of the Live Oak Library Annex at Simpkins, and this will include considerable community outreach. And we plan to select a design build team for the Aptos Library Project. Another great project is our Davenport Recycled Water Project. This project anticipates completion in September. We will be offering recycled water to farmers. Uh, this week, actually, we are planning to construct the pipeline across Highway 1, which will be <coughs> our potential water supply uh, for the ag community. Uh, additionally, we are grading the water storage pond uh, currently. Some highlights in our solid waste division. Uh, there is a lot of focus about organics processing. We will be working on the mandates of AB 293 and SB 1383. Uh, the essence of these mandates is, will result in a dramatic reduction of organic waste going to our landfill. Uh, for some numbers, by 2020, we need to reduce organic going to the landfill by 50%, and by 2025, we need to see a reduction of 75%. There is a substantial cost to, to reach these mandates, uh, we will be looking for partnerships with our local cities. Uh, we believe that through partnerships, we can find win-wins and uh, reach the mandated goals. Some of our future challenges uh, include our solid waste area. Our landfill currently has about a 10-year capacity. Uh, prior to that um, complete, um, that complete capacity, we must uh, open a, land, a, um, a um, transfer station and uh, at considerable costs, so staff is working diligently to uh, locate a, uh, a site. And one of our larger challenges is continues to be in transportation. Uh, we've had some wins here, but there continues to be challenges. Uh, I will start by commenting that our county has 600 miles of unincorporated roadways, 150 bridges. We have a deferred maintenance of about $150 million, and our current average PCR or pavement condition index is less than a 50. So our system is currently failing. Uh, but fortunately, in, the, uh, in just the past year or so, we've seen some new funding. The chart before you shows those three areas of new funding, SB1, Measure D, and a vehicle impact fee. Uh, in fiscal year 18-19, we anticipate $8 million of revenue from those combined programs. This would be in addition to our historical roadway maintenance funding, which is, comes from our gas tax and a bit of federal gas tax through the RSTP program. Our prior funding was about $9.5 million, so for perspective, this is a substantial increase, which is greatly needed for the deferred maintenance that we have. The challenge is really regarding the SB1. If you look at the SB1 number at $4.7 million, it represents about 25% of our overall maintenance funding. And this current year, this fall, there is a, a ballot uh, that will most likely include a choice by our voters to possibly repeal SB1. This would clearly devastate our proposed funding of maintenance of for roads. Additionally, SB1 currently is being used to match our storm damage projects for federal funds. It's a 25-75 program, so we have 25% of the funding, the local match, to secure 75% federal funds. And if that were to happen, if SB1 were to be repealed, we would be forced to use our Measure D funds to match those FEMA projects. That would certainly uh, increase our deferred maintenance to our road and bridge program, devastating us in the future. 
Uh, some of our unmet needs include our aging public works facilities and our aging equipment. With that, I would like to thank our dedicated and hardworking public works staff. I would like to thank our CAO office for their guidance, and I would especially like to thank your board for your continued support. Together, as a team, we can serve the public hopefully well, and especially in the future with our funding uh, plans. <clears throat> Public Works recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve the 2018-2019 budget, including any supplemental materials. Uh, staff and I are here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there questions of our Public Works Director? Supervisor Leopold? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, uh, I know you've been here uh, uh, a little bit, uh, so you're so you're starting. You know where the bathroom is, and uh, uh, and f soon you'll find every single one of the potholes that exist on our roads. <laughs> yes. Although our staff does a very good job to to get out there when when we tell them that they're there. Yes. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the the presentation, and uh, of course, uh, one of the concerns the, that uh, we all hear is about the conditions of our roadway system. And I was very um, pleased and gratified when the voters uh, uh, supported by over a two-thirds margin uh, to support Measure D. Um, that uh, that uh, effort to, to infuse uh, in here, uh, $2.7 million only to grow over time is really helpful uh, to us. Um, and to have the legislature then come around and finally, after many, many years, uh, provide a funding mechanism around uh, with SB1, um, we, uh, as I've told my constituents, uh, that with these two pieces, within a couple of years, it's a, t a totally different uh, system. And you can look at that, uh, that uh, graph you had showing the increases in funding over the next uh, uh, five to seven years. Uh, you know, we're, we, we might get a lot closer to having the money we need. The last time I remember asking staff if, uh, or we get uh, some work done, they t thought it had cost about $12 million to maintain our 600-mile road system. It's a couple years old, so now it's a couple million dollars more, I'm sure. Yes. But when you look at those three sources that you pointed out and saw that by 2023 there was $13 million there, uh, you, you can see that we're getting a, a lot closer to having what we need uh, and to increase our PCI, our pavement condition index. So um, I think that uh, it's gonna take a lot of work and I appreciate the work of uh, Mr. Wiesner, uh, who's, who is uh, Johnny on the spot when we call about these uh, different projects. Um, and sometimes when we push projects, try to push projects up the, the, um, uh, the priority list. Uh, so, he has a, a very uh, difficult juggling job, and I appreciate uh, his ability to work with the staff uh, uh, and me. Um, I also, uh, in hearing about the, the list of roads that are gonna be sur resurfaced uh, this year with Measure D funds, I'm glad that they're uh, more of our rural roads. Um, you know, one of the things that we told people is that uh, when, um, during the very difficult years of the Great Recession, we did not have the money to to maintain our road system, and it was a triage system, and we focused on arterials and collectors and you know the places where it got the most traffic. But I know that my rural residents kept on wondering, what about what about us? And so to, uh, uh, the the folks on Miller Hill and Miller Hill Cutoff are really excited, but it's also it, people up in the mountains in my district now believe that things will get better. And I think if uh, we are all gonna have to work very hard uh, to prevent the repeal of SB1, and I appreciate the effort the staff has taken to make sure that we have signage so people can see that, that where we're spending that money and that they can get the benefit of it. Um, and hopefully we'll remember it when they get to the ballot box in November. Um, the, the, one of the things that I think we'll need to do a better job uh, on uh, Mr. Machado is to tell the story of when we do this work. You know, the, the Public Works Department, our road uh, crews and others do incredibly important work, which most people don't have any idea about. Um, 
Uh, and we have got to figure out a better way to tell that story. And it's, I think it's especially important over the next couple of months as we want them to see that investment. But I think it would be very important for the department and for the county as a whole so people can see that investment, their dollars actually making a difference. And so I really encourage you to think about that, work with our public information officer and really think about um, um, sharing the story of, of what we're doing for our county infrastructure um, in a better way. Um, I, think it, I think it will really benefit everyone. Um, I also want to, what you called special services, uh, you know, the, our, our landfill um, always seems to have at least 10 years left on it. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's had 10 years left on it for a long time. Um, and I know we're getting to the end of that magic uh, of being done and we have to start preparing for it. But I also want to express my appreciation for the staff who tries to figure out ways that we can keep things out of our landfill and the wrong things in our landfill. And uh, just this week, the National Association of Counties put out a, an article about a drug take back program um, in the state of Washington. And they said really counties led the way for this. And you know, uh, through Tim Goncharoff and, and, this, and the staff, you know, we've developed this pharmaceutical take back program, a Sharps uh, take back program. Uh, other pieces that have been really great models, and we've been recognized for it, but it's, we're gonna have to continue to work to figure out how to keep things out of the landfill instead of, uh, and so we can keep that, the, the little bit of the magic going a little bit longer um, in, our, uh, in, the, in the life of that landfill. Um, the one thing as we think uh, differently about development here in Santa Cruz County, I think we need to think differently about where we uh, invest in infrastructure. And I'd like you to think more creatively than we have in the past about how we spend our infrastructure dollars and where we need um, uh, to spend those dollars. And, I, and I'm not sure, I mean, I'm interested in, in whether you think we need a more, um, a stronger plan so we know that as we look at focusing development that we have the infrastructure in place to be able to support that development. But I'd like to work with you in order to help make that happen because I think we, uh, one of the things that um, uh, hasn't always been done well in the county is planning ahead as communities urbanize. The, the, the district that I represent um, was a farming community in the early 70s and by the late 70s, it is, it is rapidly turned into an urban environment. And fortunately, we had a redevelopment agency for 20 years that put in sidewalks, drainage, curbs, gutters, uh, and built some public infrastructure, but we didn't get it done in 25 years. Um, and now we're looking to put more people there. And so how do we do that? That we look at doing that in other places, that we look about uh, uh, bonus densities and all these different things we need to have the infrastructure in place to be able to support it. So I, I would appreciate working with you. Um, uh, I think the Public Works Department uh, does a, a very good job. There's a lot of people here who uh, our staff works with on a regular basis, uh, and I appreciate uh, that work, and I look forward to working with you on the challenges we have ahead. Great, thank you. Your notes are well, well taken, thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Machado, welcome. Uh, you never thought you were gonna get into something like this, I guess, but uh, we've, uh, we've got a lot of challenges and a lot of uncertainty, of course, with uh, Senate Bill 1 that's gonna be probably on the ballot uh, in November, but first of all, I wanna thank the voters for their foresight in passing Measure D uh, a couple years ago. Uh, that was really a critical thing, and uh, Whatever happens to that Senate Bill 1 referendum move, which I do certainly hope, fail, uh, hope fails, and you've heard me say that, uh, deliver that message before. Um, but uh, important part of Measure D was that uh, it, it allowed, it, we became a, what they call a self-help county, and so there's a pocket of millions of dollars uh, in that Senate bill that would come to self-help counties, and there's not uh, a great number of them in, in the state. So. Uh, we'd be particularly hit hard. We wouldn't get what we can anticipate of that. Uh, I think it, overall it's $5 billion throughout the state and uh, about half going to local governments and half to the state. So um, we'll be, there'll be plenty of discussions about that. 
And with that being said, I want to thank the Public Works Department for prioritizing and getting uh, more uh, people to. Uh, our, is people to look at what the needs are and what are the greatest needs and allow um, us to uh, address them. I, and I want to just say to our Santa Cruz County residents, um, we do have Measure D money. We Right now we have the Senate Bill 1 money, but uh, it's not enough to cover what I think was estimated as $86 million of road damage in the 2016-17 storms. I, I, my understanding also is that we got about $20 million done on that. So this is going to take some years to get to everybody's road. And uh, we're moving as quickly as we can. And I think the Public Works Department has made that clear of what the priorities are. And uh, I hope that they just have some patience. We're, we're going as quickly as we can and doing an excellent job of that. And uh, uh, I could start saying a few um, nice things. Everybody in the Public Works Department is to be commended for that. Uh, we've really addressed some really serious issues. And as was mentioned in this organic processing, um, these are sta state mandates. And so it, it, they, the state helps us, but that puts the pressure on us to get it done, too. So not only are, is Public Works Department a road department, but it's the landfill, as you've mentioned and all. And, it, and we've... Uh, We've really done a good job as a county to uh, lighten the load on our landfills, but as uh, uh, Supervisor Leopold said, that 10-year uh, window that was probably what first mentioned 30 years ago um, is is going to close sometime. And uh, But the, the fact that we have these state mandates of what we have to do, and it's rightly so, I don't have uh, disagree with it, but it puts a lot of financial pressure on us to get that done as well. And with that said, too, um, we have in the San Lorenzo Valley some recycling programs that are, have been going on for years, and the communities mar commodities market has just dropped. Uh, China's not accepting some of those commodities, and it's putting a lot of pressure on how they can survive. We've helped them along the way in recent years. I don't know how long that can go on, but um, People in Santa Cruz County, residents of Santa Cruz County, are very serious about their recycling and environmental protection overall. And um, it's those types of issues that we're going to have to try to meet as well as we move along. Uh, but in general, I just want to say thank you for uh, the Public Works Department for reacting to some huge uh, crisis that we had in, in rebuilding our road system. Uh, People of Santa Cruz County, be patient. We're going to get there, but there's uh, um, we have a plan of attack how to do that, and I think we've done an excellent job of getting to a lot of projects in this last year. So thank you very much, and to everybody else in the uh, Public Works Department. Thank you for your comments. Uh, regarding that storm damage, we believe it could take upwards of five years to get to all of those repairs, and that's with SB1 in place. So fingers crossed that SB1 stays alive so that we can get to all those repair projects. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, I want to thank you for being uh, uh, the new head of the uh, Public Works. Uh, uh, when people ask uh, what supervisors do, a lot of times it comes down, you know, there, uh, there are a lot of areas like public safety and everything, they're very important. but. Uh, public works can be anything from a pothole in front of somebody's house to a uh, uh, $200 million project as far as uh, flood prevention on a Pajaro River. So anything in between. And uh, all of them are important, especially if you have that pothole in front of your house. So it's, um, I guess on uh, different projects, uh, uh, a critical thing, and you're taking over at a critical time, is the Pajaro River flood prevention one. And we don't want to drop the ball on that. We want to make sure that we get all the paperwork done and everything. And that's a big responsibility to throw on you uh, in the first uh, six months on the job. So anyway, uh, hopefully we can help you along the way and do everything we can. And you have a, you have a good staff working with you. And uh, so we'll, we'll be in touch. Um, and the, uh, the other would be <clears throat> some of the other things we can talk about later, but not right now, is the update on the uh, uh, Highway 152, which is East Lake Avenue and uh, Houlihan Road. 
it uh, looked like we had some funding for that and maybe uh, it's fallen through, as, as, but we still have a chance of getting it. And then uh, also uh, we did, I wanna thank the staff <coughs> for getting, excuse me, for getting the uh, uh, Casserly Bridge uh, uh, fixed over there by Smith Road and um, uh, and it's completed and it was done. So we, we saved a little money on that. I don't know uh, if, uh, when we save money on one project, maybe can we shift it over and uh, help out on another project? Uh, hopefully we can do that. Yeah, I think, it, yes. Uh, saving money on one project will allow us to do other projects. So absolutely, we will always try to spread our money as far and wide as we possibly can. Yes. Right. Okay. And then uh, the other would be, uh, let's see, oh, it's, uh, just an example of how quick uh, Public Works has uh, responded in the past. Uh, Smith, Smith Road people were complaining about uh, trees growing over the uh, road and uh, uh, after calling uh, the uh, maintenance crew uh, number uh, request, uh, within two weeks, uh, Smith Road was taken care of. I just want to thank the staff for doing that. Uh, and, uh, and also all the work that uh, the, your department has uh, did in the past with the uh, storm we had in 2017. And, uh, doing in just an incredible amount of uh, work uh, under terrible conditions. So we're still recovering from that. $200 million plus in damage from that storm. And um, uh, how, how is the funding going on that? That's probably my last question. So the, uh, the reimbursement through the federal government, uh, we're still responding to their questions, their comments. Uh, we've got packages put together. We haven't received reimbursement yet, but we're in good shape to receive that. We believe we will receive 100% reimbursement. And so we think we're in, in good shape. It's just a slow process. So we're, we're being very diligent and, and watching it closely and crossing our T's and dotting the I's because that's what they, they want. Yeah, and with all the th things that were that I was talking about, I, I really hope that uh, uh, the staff stays stable and we don't have any more surprises uh, uh, because it's very difficult uh, in transition from going from one to the other to the other. And so, uh, and I guess uh, real quick, uh, with uh, Mark Sturdley, uh, he's in charge of looking at after the Pajaro River project, uh, is he gonna have some help on that? Is there somebody on the staff that's gonna be able to help him out also? So in zone seven, uh, we are filling the assistant director position, uh, which will add uh, an additional body in that area to help oversee. Uh, Mark is doing a fabulous job. You mentioned you know, the Pajaro River and staying the course and pushing. Mark is the right, the right person for that job. Uh, and that assistant position that we hope to fill in the next few months, we'll continue to reinforce that effort. You bet. And thank you very much. Uh, welcome aboard and looking forward to talking to you uh, more in the future. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. Thank you. We'll now open it up for the community. There's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the public works budget item. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. <laughs> I also want to welcome Mr. Machado to the county. I think he's a breath of fresh air. And that he has been willing to talk with me about my concerns is really a welcome change. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Um, I just want to mention in the past accomplishments that there was a real debacle with the uh, vision recycling and solid waste thing. I won't go into it, but that was a travesty and a real debacle, the way that was handled. I want to... Um, comment to Supervisor Caput's uh, suggestion, if there's money saved on one project, put it into another. That has already happened. $38,000 from a school safety project in Watsonville was uh, given to the Aptos Village project 
um, mitigations in Aptos Village. So that's already happening, maybe not to where you think it should go, but that's where it is. I want to register again my, my protest against so much money being spent in the Aptos Village traffic improvement projects that is mitigation for the Aptos Village project itself. The TIA fees are um, unrealistically low. There was no multiplier for restaurant use, which has a v the highest rate of use for new traffic that would have increased TIA fees. There will be four restaurants within the Aptos Village project. I also want to say that the relocation of the bus stop included in phase one of the Aptos Village project uh, traffic improvement um, improvements brought unrealistic expense to the public and to the Soquel Creek Water District. They had to spend um, $75,000 to relocate their water pipes just to move the bus stop, and the purpose of that bus stop is to make a gateway for the Aptos Village Project Parade Street and to mollify the very upset uh, existing businesses that are going to lose their on-street parking because of that. Um, the application was to, for that new crossing was to have a certificate of indemnification by the developers, and the county did not get that. So that leaves the county open for a possible liability for accidents there, if it happens. The um, CPUC approval for that new crossing has expired under CPUC law. The um, a county should have applied for extension 30 days before the expiration. There has been no uh, letter to call for a, an extension, and that is through uh, CPUC records. I want to ask that there be more money spent for um, maintenance of the Freedom Boulevard bike lane. It's overgrown and a very hazardous place right now for our cyclists. And to ask for mowing on Thank roadsides you. for fire safety. Thank you very Thank much. You. Is there anybody else who'd like to address us on this budget item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? The recommended action for the public works. Second. Budget. A motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Kundry. Thank you for the presentation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We have our final item for today, which is the, to approve the 2018-19 proposed budget for the plant acquisition section of the capital projects, including any supplemental budget materials as recommended by the CAO. We have the capital project list for 18-19. Excuse me, we have the capital projects proposed budget, the capital projects line item detail, and the plant acquisition project detail. Good afternoon and welcome, Ms. Lindbergh. Good afternoon, um, Chair Friend and members of the board. I'm Betsy Lindbergh, Director of Capital Projects and Public Works, and with me is Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. We're here to provide an overview of the Capital Projects Plant Acquisition Budget. Uh, representatives from other departments who um, are performing work funded from the plant acquisition budget are also here if you have questions. And the focus of this presentation is on the plant acquisition budget. Capital projects does also include infrastructure project budgets, uh, which were just approved as part of the public works uh, department budget. So six funds make up the plant acquisition budget. These are for county facilities, uh, balance of redevelopment funds, and parks. Go ahead. And um, three major projects were completed uh, this past year. That includes the Round Tree Rehabil Rehabilitation and Reentry Project. There was a ribbon cutting for that project in May, and the Sheriff's Office is now preparing to accept inmates into the new facility. We also have the solar energy project, which is uh, pretty much on its final leg with the uh, Center for Public Justice being the last uh, facility to be switched over from uh, pg e to uh, solar. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Carol Johnson, uh, who was recognized by the clean air, as a clean air leader from the uh, Monterey Air District Resource Board. Um, the agri model is also completed. Uh, it has, we have finished the punch list and we plan on bringing an item back to the board here in August for a notice of completion. The identified in the budget for 1819 is about $1.75 million of additional funding for new projects. I know this, the slide says about $2.5 million, but the general fund contribution actually goes right to the capital facilities fund. 
You'll notice the dollar amounts are the exact same. So we have about $1.75 million of additional funding for next year. To break down what that $1.75 million is, we have uh, $750,000 identified for current county office buildings. One of them is $75,000 to replace the copper piping for this building for other restrooms. We are having some uh, failures within our current piping, which is causing some minor leaks. Uh, so to replace that copper piping is going to be about $75,000. We also have a weather sealing project for $225,000, which is for the roof of 701. Uh, this building. Uh, when we installed the solar uh, uh, panels on top of the roof, we realized we had some uh, um, roof maintenance that needed to be completed. Uh, we also have set aside $450,000 for future maintenance needs uh, as they pop up, uh, depending on uh, what we have. So this chart highlights park projects. Um, you'll see that the funding sources include park dedication funds and other special park funds and former redevelopment funds. Um, Aptos park dedication funds will be used for playground replacement and accessibility uh, improvements at Hidden Beach Playground. And park staff has shared that they are also working with the community to raise additional funds for repair and maintenance work there. And everyone is looking forward to the um, new bike pump track at Pinto Lake. And there's some other um, improvements um, planned for the coming year as well. And this chart provides an overview of the library projects, which were also touched on um, in the Public Works Department um, presentation. So these projects will be constructed over the next three to four years. The uh, Felton Library project is to, uh, anticipated to be under construction this fall. Uh, construction of renovation improvements at La Selva Beach, Boulder Creek, and Live Oak branches will follow in spring of 2019. Construction of the Live Oak Library Annex at Simpkins Swim and Community Center is planned for about two years from now. And the Major S work um, will wrap up with a major renovation of the Aptos Library. So when we think of our capital improvements and we look at our current approach, which has kind of been, um, for maintenance wise, has been kind of a reactionary. Uh, we've been providing minimal preventative maintenance to our current facilities that we have. Um, we've been very strategic as a county with our investments with limited funding. Uh, for example, for our libraries, we were able to do some renovations through our Measure S. Sheriff Roundtree model, we were able to accomplish a grant to help us uh, renovate that facility. Solar installation project, we were able to do through a bond and ultimately pay for it through our savings, through our PG&E savings. Uh, probation gym remodel, again, same thing through a grant. So we've been very strategic as a county trying to uh, source uh, outside funding to help us with our facilities maintenance needs. Uh, but even with that said, we still estimate about $80 million in plant unmet needs uh, in, our, in our county. Um, when we look at uh, the future, some of the things that we're going to try to do is to become very proactive and kind of strategic uh, and continue our strategicness with our capital facilities and capital improvements. Uh, we're going to start looking at um, performing uh, asset preservation through uh, facility condition indexing, uh, facilities master planning uh, related to our future growth of our county, and make sure that we preserve our current assets that we have uh, currently um, for all county facilities. With that there, uh, that concludes our presentation for capital improvements. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the CEO's office, uh, including Trish Daniels for helping us prepare this presentation for your board, uh, as well as Amy Mio Cuso, I apologize, uh, for her help and work with the uh, proposed uh, capital improvement program plan. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from board members? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. Uh, well, one is I'm happy to see that we have some resources to put through this, but I'm also happy to see that we have um, two really capable, smart people looking at our resources. I think we haven't, we haven't treated our county facilities as resources, uh, and I think there's a tremendous opportunity here uh, to both assess them, but then also to think about how we use them in a way um, that's the most beneficial to taxpayers and to, our, to the county. So uh, I'm excited about this effort. I'm excited that you actually uh, got called out uh, for, this, for this specific budget hearing and, and the work that's beginning. So keep, keep it up. Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think during the years of the Great Recession, the, the Board of Supervisors and the CAO's office made a decision 
that we were gonna try to keep as much money <clears throat> uh, on the street and with services to people and not, um, and defer maintenance on our facilities. Um, and uh, you can only do that for so long. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can only do that for so long. And so I'm glad that uh, with new leadership in the department um, that we can start trying to take a look at this and figure out how we do it so we don't have a problem down the line. Um, uh, I really uh, uh, appreciated uh, the work that Ms. Lindbergh does on capital projects. I've seen it for many years, uh, first with the redevelopment agency and now in, in her role um, in public works. Uh, we count on her to, to build everything. So uh, thank you for that ongoing work. And uh, Carol Johnson has been a stalwart in the department and, um, and uh, does incredible work. And so I'm really grateful to hear that she won an award. Uh, because she does award-winning work. And uh, I, I appreciate when I get the chance to work with her and she's always there when, when I need her. And, and so I, I, um, uh, I thank her for that work and I, uh, I look forward to continuing to work on these capital improvements. I think, um, you know, uh, for our CAO, we also have to figure out some long-term st strategies about financing this and that may be something that come back as part of an overall financing strategy. Thank you. Anybody else on this item? Supervisor Caput? Yeah, I, I just say, uh, uh, with uh, you're wearing a different hat. <laughs> okay, I'm used to seeing you. Uh, you were with the uh, Health and Human Services. The Health Services uh, Agency. That, that yes. was, and then that's changed also. So we got to get used to that. <laughs> how, how are you feeling as far as the transition from one to the other? Uh, I'm absolutely loving it. I do miss my uh, uh, health services agency family. Uh, I miss uh, my fiscal team, my admin team. Um, uh, I had a great the health services agency was just a great organization. Uh, I am really loving general services. The the staff here are phenomenal. Working with Carol Johnson has been f phenomenal, and the support of the CEO's office has been great. So I'm I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, Jane Gwen, uh, where is she now? Do, uh, do you have, do we do we know? Uh, the last I heard from Jane uh, was she was retiring uh, from uh, uh, governmental service. Uh, so I know that uh, she's looking for better things uh, in life and retirement. Uh, but I have a feeling she's not going to be. Uh, uh, right. Boyd. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we had John Presley uh, move on also and Jane Gwen. So we've had a lot of changes and they were very good people. Miss them. Yep. Thank you. And I'm sure you're going to do a great job. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll open it up for the community. Does anybody actually like to address us on the plant acquisition and capital project budget? Thank you. Good morning. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I'm really delighted that uh, the county is putting up so many great solar panels. I see them at Simkins. I see them in many places. Um, what, what did um, disturb me was the number of very large trees that were removed, and so I would like to ask what is the uh, reforestation component of that project? Uh, where will the new trees be planted, and how many and what kind? And um, I want to ask why there are no improvements um, in your presentation to the Aptos Village Park. That is, uh, that really has nothing. The playground was taken away. I used to go there a lot with my kids, but it was taken away. and. Um, has since become kind of a dog park and a place for, for special events. Um, so I'd like something put back in there for the youth that most likely will be coming with as the uh, Aptos Village Project affordable housing and, and the good housing that's going in there comes online. Um, related to that, the Great American Music Festival is gone. They're not coming back to the Aptos Village Park because there is no place to stage their equipment. And um, I think that's a real loss for the, the community. So I would like to, again, ask Supervisor Friend that you negotiate, help us negotiate with... Uh, I just want to know what this has to do with capital improvements or project uh, plan acquisition. I mean, if you could at least... Park acquisition. Qu quasi make it that park way. Park acquisition is what I'm talking about. Okay, it doesn't sound like it so far, so just, I'm just trying to get okay. it to, to that. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, 
please, my time's burning, let me talk. Mm -hmm. um, park acquisition, I would like to see negotiations as a public-private partnership to acquire at least a portion of phase two for parking and uh, public use. And uh, in finality, I just want to once again protest my, uh, protest the use of Measure S funds for the Live Oak Annex, Library Annex. It's a community center, and I think it's, it's gonna be really great for the community, but I don't think it's fair to call it a library and use Measure S money with a small collection of books. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to, from the community like to address this on this item? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move for recommended uh, actions for the capital approval. projects budget. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for the presentation. We will reconvene tomorrow at 9 a.m. here as budget uh, hearings will continue. Thank you for Community TV for covering. <laughs>